Frank is going to be very late or not Frank's, here. Frank, he texted yeah. me, said he's going to be very late if he can make it at all. I may miss did the meeting he, Did he remember that we were supposed to let John for now? We're recording, John. Yep. Okay. Um, Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable being recorded saying that, <laughs> uh, just to be clear. Um, and Kelly's going to be ready to I think now we break into the summer. Oh, um, okay. Okay. Just in Frank's defense, I just got an email. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. So we're going to open the meeting and with the applicant's uh, permission. No, oh, no, we have six. We have six. Yeah. Why? How do you have six? Don't you? One, two, three. No, we don't. Oh, have we don't. Six. No. We have to wait for the sixth person. Uh, now's when we break into the song and dance routine. So why don't you can stay there? Um, we do other business. Yes, let's do other business. Uh, do your A and R plan. You can do minutes. Yeah, yeah. Let's approve. Everybody have the chance to look at the minutes from June twenty-sixth. So yeah, I apologize they were not in your package, but they did get sent to you. They get sent this late. Afternoon. Yeah. I'll move the minutes as written. A second. Oh, any comments? No. Nope, nope. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. So passed. The A and R so plan. They're, they're not attending, but um, I can tell you, um, it's basically just the switching around of lot lines to make a the lot a little bit cleaner. Then it's all land that he currently owns. He's just cleaning up some of the lot lines. It's okay. Pretty basic. Um, it meets the requirements for an A and R plan. Okay. Do we get a? We'll do a motion to approve. So and moved. then do we have a second. A uh, second. Uh, any discussion? So Jennifer, Question. just reiterate again for me. What the yeah, so it's all land that he currently owns, and he's just cleaning up some of the lot lines to make one of his buildable lots a little bit cleaner. Uh, one of them, I think, is land court land, so he's trying to adjust some of that, that land. So it's really just an adjustment on the size of the lots, not changing from the perspective. Correct, yeah, and it still meets square footage in front of you. All within his own property. <laughs> That's correct. Very good. Is that your vote? Yep. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, abstain, so carry. We have two signatures and what's the name? Can I allow this one? Yes, I'm sorry, no, but let me just move that so we don't have it. Yes. Sorry, deep green. Thank you. How was everybody's weekend as we wait? <laughs> there she is. Yeah. Yeah. All right, we got six. Woo! Sorry. That's no, okay. that's okay. Okay, not too bad at 634. Well, let's finish this and then we'll open the public hearing. Just two. All right, just two? Just two, yeah. Just two. Let's open the uh, continuation of the public hearing. Special uh, permit for subdivision off Chamberlain Street and Wayland Road. Can I Remember ask if um, uh, CONCOM reps are here? Oh, yep, there we go. Thank you. Um, sounds like my microphone is hugely loud. Um, so the first order of business, um, as you, most people will remember from last time, we had requested an opinion from town council. Um, the planning board has received that opinion this week, but we were told by town council that we were not able to release that information to the public until we voted as a board tonight um, in order to do that. 
Um, I have my own personal feelings on that, and I, you know, as a separate issue when we talk about um, uh, process with the planning board, um, I'd like to see if there's a way we can avoid that going forward because I, I, there's no protection under executive meetings and anything to keep things um, from the public. So it would have been my preference if we could have um, made it public as we got it, but we were told that we could not. Um, so the first order of business we'll take tonight is to vote to release that to the public. Um, I would like <coughs> to um, ask my fellow board members to contemplate um, being open to holding ourselves to the same standard we hold others so that because that information was not uh, available to people on our Tuesday deadline that we are amenable to reacting and discussing and addressing it at a future meeting um, if that is something that we, we need to do. Um, so at any rate, I will entertain a motion um, to make that opinion public. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Discussion. Oh, okay. discussion, thank you. What was the rationale for uh, town council not to have that released prior <laughs> to the board seeing it? Um, so when I spoke to uh, Mr. Miari, the attorney Miari, um, his answer to me was that it's under attorney-client privilege until the client waives the privilege because the planning board itself was the client. The planning board cannot take any action as a board until it meets in public session to vote on that action. So that was his reasoning. So it just sounds like a procedural item, right? It is. I, yeah. I tend to uh, be in your camp on this. I mean, I think it's important that the public see it, but also the proponent yeah. see it. So, so I think now that we know that going forward, if this ever is an issue in the future, we would probably take that vote when we take the vote to ask council for the opinion, right. that we would waive client privilege at that time. Right. Um, did you happen to ask if that would work for him? What? Taking that vote ahead of time? He didn't seem to have an issue waiving the, the privilege. He said it, it's strictly up to the client, which is the planning board of assistance. Anybody else? All those in favor of making that public? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Jennifer. Yes. yes. So uh, the next thing that uh, I wanted to do before we get to the CONCOM piece is just to ask you to um, explain what that opinion means to us and to the public. <laughs> I'm not a lawyer, so. Um, but what I believe, and I didn't really have a lot of time to speak with town council about it, but um, what I do believe um, that it means is that as the open space plan is proposed with two pulp sacks, would not be allowed under our zoning bylaw and would not be approvable by this board in, in basic language, that's what I believe. Could the applicant apply for a waiver? Um, so a waiver through the zoning bylaw would have to go to the Board of Appeals. So any um, any waiver, just to clarify that, any waiver to the cul-de-sac or dead end component? No, no. so we, because this is an open space subdivision, which is a zoning bylaw, 
the zoning bylaw waivers go through the Board of Appeals. Any waiver of your subdivision regulations under a definitive plan would be waived through you. But the open space aspect of it makes it a zoning issue, which would go through the Board of Appeals. else have any questions while I'm contemplating my thought process here? So I guess what would the steps be, the order of that then, if they wanted a waiver from the Zoning Board of Appeals? So Sorry. Um, what would the steps be if they did want to apply for a waiver with the Zoning Board of Appeals? Well, there could be a couple different, like they could do that first. There could be a couple different ways they could go about it. Um, since the first step in this process is for the Planning Board to issue a special permit with for the use and the number of lots. The planning board could do that with the caveat that any de design, pro project design, meet your bylaw or receive approval from the Board of Appeals. So you could still proceed with this process, issue your special permit with those conditions. They could then go to the Board of Appeals if they wanted to proceed to try to get the, the variance. <coughs> So, and let me just ask this, and from my, from my reading of the, the town council's opinion, mm -hmm. if we, the uh, applicant was going to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals mm -hmm. to waive the cul-de-sac length restriction, yes. um, they, they could do that without the emergency access road. Yes. Can I ask a question? Yeah, absolutely. So, Kathy Sherry, RSC Hop Kitchen. Um, in the opinion, it's not specifically stated, but I, I know that our lawyer had brought up the issue of whether or not, because the dead end is under the intensity regulation section of the bylaw, and the planning board is able to waive the intensity regulations, that this doesn't fall underneath that and specifically can't be waived. So I didn't ask that question, Council, because that wasn't posed to me, but I did, because that was brought up, I did check with um, our zoning enforcement officer who does enforce the zoning bylaw. Um, and his um, view on that was, um, because, sorry, I just want to get that language correct. If you read the actual language, it says the planning board may grant a reduction of all intensity regulations. And I don't think you want us to reduce <laughs> the length of the cul-de-sac. So, um, before we go to uh, the next step, if there's anybody um, who ha has questions from the, the public or immediate questions or reactions, it's not something that we're going to give people time to be able to react to it. I'm, I'm like a terrible feedback here. I'm right sorry. Here. Um, uh, we'll have plenty. You know, this it's not like you won't have an opportunity to react and ask questions after tonight. I want to make sure people know that. Yes, did you have a question? So should we get some feedback from the applicant? I don't know what how they feel. Well I don't I don't know if they're prepared to right, react just to offer, at least tonight. offer it up. Yes. Uh, our initial thought was our initial thought was this is somewhat what we were expecting mm -hmm. we thought might come through, is that um, to go to the Board of Appeals, et cetera, we would probably represent with a cut through straight through road, the open space. Uh, plan with a straight through road instead of having the emergency access. And I think that we would look more strongly at some traffic calming measures and the design of the road to make sure uh, or to limit, try to limit and also control the speed through the area to address some of the concerns that have been brought up today. So Paul's asking the question. <laughs> I'm, I'm not an attorney. I'm no, not no, no. I'm, I, I mean, I'm, I'm giving you some time. I, I sympathize. This is not the way to, to receive information and react right. to it. So nobody needs to feel obligated to react to it tonight. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I've spent a lot of time thinking about is that um, <coughs> this, this, this proposed development is very unique in a lot of ways. And in a very positive fashion, it is very unique in that there's been an awful lot of work between the abutters 
and the applicant to come up with a solution that is most attractive um, to all. And I, as a planning board member, would be very motivated to try and find a way to support um, a design for this development that respected everybody's desires, especially the abutters who live <coughs> currently on two very quiet streets. So I am more interested in finding a solution that works for everybody rather than sort of throwing up our hands and just doing what, what feels maybe um, easiest. And I understand that it's, it's a complicating <coughs> factor. But, but only speaking for myself, I'm very motivated to find a way um, that the planning board, the applicant, the abutters, and potentially the Board of Appeals, I know that's more fun than anybody wanted, um, could work together. But what one of the things that I would like to do in the, between now and the next hearing is find out exactly what our options are and if there are options that don't include the Board of Appeals, but that's what we're hearing right now. I have one question. Yeah. I'm not sure the answer, Jennifer, but hypothetically speaking, if they did um, turn down the special permit, <clears throat> does, it, does the planning board uh, have the power to grant the waiver as a conventional plan? Uh, I know you said as a special, for the special permit, they can't. It's gotta go through Board of Appeals. Sure. I think if we did go to Board of Appeals, there's no way they're gonna give, you know, the, you gotta show a hardship. They're not gonna grant that. Sure. But let's just say that the planning board said, okay, we're gonna deny the special permit. Mm -hmm. Uh, so then we have to go through the conventional, and then let's just say that we did everything that was on the open space plan, and then we did the not having the cut through, and then we did the, you know, we did the emergency, emergency access. access right. Could the board then, in their bylaws, grant the waiver? So th there is an opportunity under the subdivision regulations for the board to waive the um, dead, at, dead end street exam, um, exception. Um, for exceptional circumstances, they would have to find some exceptional circumstances for them to be able to do that. Um, some examples would be, you know, an environmentally challenged site or topography, or in the past they've also accepted large donations of land um, for the public good. So there is an opportunity for that as well. Well, I mean, if, if we're I doing may, <clears throat> just as a theoretical, right. <laughs> If you went through ZBA and it was turned down, and we decided to turn down the open space, it could be submitted as a conventional plan. As presented here, what you would need is for the board to see exceptional circumstances, which may be the inclusion of the office parcel that you've already discussed as the exceptional gift of land. And then the only follow-up that would be necessary at the next town meeting, there would have to be a vote of the town to accept the land. Is that, but is that true for any conventional plan under those conditions? I mean, well, this, that's not exceptional, right? That's no, but any doesn't any donation of land has to be accepted oh, yeah, by the, the town uh, accepted by the town. Yeah. And that doesn't happen in an open space because that's part and parcel of the zone. No, the town still accepts the land. Yeah, so yeah. that's not that's not different. Right. That piece that isn't different. different. So you, there's a theoretical there's there's two potential paths to come to the same. So, John, can I ask you this question? You just outlined a process whereby they would have to go through the Board of Appeals, and my understanding no, not was necessary. I thought that's what I heard you say, so I wanted to clarify. Right. So um, the path that, that Mr. Mastriani outlined is if we were theoretically to um, deny this special permit, he could come forward Correct. with a conventional plan that um, could be the cul-de-sac option with the open space donation, the historical thing, the trails preserved. Or it could um, be the connector also. And, yes. I mean, they, they restrict the emergency connector. With or without the emergency. Right. Uh, but I think what I'm understanding from a preponderance of the reading from the abutters on both ends is that they would be happiest if there was a strip of preserved property through those cul-de-sacs um, so that there was not a, a connecting road. Um, I just, and I, I don't want to speak for anybody out of turn, but I think that that's what I'm reading um, as, as I look through all the materials. They don't care about the materials. 
if that was allowable under the conventional and the subdivision and through the waiver, then that would be. We would do that. We would do that. Um, so I guess we, it, some of us, I know, I, I'm guessing all of us have done a lot of thinking about this. Um, this is my first experience, I'll be honest with you, my first experience with um, so much effort and constructive uh, cooperation and, and work on the beh behalf of all parties to find um, amenable, workable solutions. So I commend everybody. Um, and I th again, I'm only speaking for myself, and I, don't, I welcome other people to weigh in. Um, I'm, I'm very, very desirous of a solution that is the best possible solution for all parties. Anybody else have any thoughts on this particular? If I can hop in one second, it would be beneficial mm -hmm. to give some, if we all gave our input on the way we saw it, if it, they came to us. And the question is, uh, just to give a, a brief update, as town council basically said, open, under the open mm -hmm. space, we cannot do a waiver. So two options were presented. One is going to ZBA to waive that, and number two was to submit a conventional plan that was as presented. But necessary for that, we would have to uh, recognize and accept that there were exceptional circumstances to accept it, which could include environmental issues or could include uh, uh, donation of land, et cetera. And in order to give the applicant some feedback from us, and I think it would be beneficial <coughs> if we gave a reacting to the theoretical uh, what people's thoughts were. Do you want to I'll, I'll. Let's let some other brave volunteers okay. go. Sure, some other brave I'll, I'll talk. Thanks, I, I think it. Um, <coughs> I mean, if that theoretical were to come forward, uh, I think a lot of people, uh, just based on my feedback from the two site visits, would people would be amenable to that. Uh, I think it kind of uh, addresses the needs of both the proponent, as well as I think some of the folks, I, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the folks in the audience, as well as the abutters. So, so I, I'm, you yeah, would I support it. I think okay. so. I would want to just, I mean, the only thing is, is it setting a potential precedent? Right, that would be the one thing to be cognizant of, but I think given the fact that there's exceptional circumstances that you can define here on multiple levels, I think it probably passes the red face test on, on that. I, I just wanted to jump in with that. I'm glad you said that, Fran, if nobody minds. Um, I've been thinking about that as well. The precedence? The precedence f feature, because that's pretty important, uh, a pretty important consideration. Um, and what I didn't say when I was giving, you know, my, my feelings on what I would most support, um, we didn't talk about preserving the character of the two neighborhoods specifically and the safety features and the fact that I'm not sure that, that we couldn't have an exceptional presence for the fact that we are connecting two long-standing um, neighborhoods. Um, I don't know that that happens ever or often, um, but I've thought a little bit about that too. It's just, it's a unique circumstance that, that we would be creating a, a through road through very, very quiet, long established neighborhoods would change the character of those neighborhoods, absolutely. And, and uh, certainly I think the master plan would support some emphasis that way. Yeah, so the thought that I had would be that we recently had some legal issues with Dunkin' Donuts and that we would need to be careful about anything that we do and that we should obviously get it approved by town council in that respect. So, I mean, we need to do what's right, but we need to do what's right for the town in general. Obviously, we've been trying to satisfy both parties here the best we can, but in the long run, it really is the town that we represent. So. I'm not saying I'd leave one way or the other, but I'm just saying there's some concern. Okay. <coughs> so I, I guess I would just echo what most have said that, I mean, I think the open space plan is far more beneficial than the conventional, you know, it preserves more wetlands, the lot lines are drawn to preserve the historic structures, you know, the trail structure remains a little more intact. 
um, it's further from the lots are further from the wetlands. Um, it's just the drawback is the that we can't approve a waiver for the. Amy, you speak into your mic? Yeah, I'm sorry. It doesn't. The microphone doesn't actually work to help folks in the audience as much as it is for TV. For TV. So you just need to speak up so the audience can hear you. Yeah. There it is there. Does it come up a little bit? Oh yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think the open space plan is far preferable, except that we have the problem that we cannot issue the waiver to have the shorter, to have the, the very long cul-de-sacs. So I think in general, like the short cul-de-sac is a good bylaw that we want to use, and it has helped a lot of neighborhoods in town not have these giant cul-de-sac extensions. But it, this is an exceptional circumstance, and I do think we need to be clear when we um, when we vote on it that these are two neighborhoods that have been here a very, very long time without any, they had no idea that they were going to have, that there was buildable land behind between the two that could, could be made into a through road. And so that's a different circumstance than than we're usually seeing. So I, I would be in favor of an open space like plan submitted as conventional with the, the gated access for emergencies. But I'm not sure that we can have it. I mean, I think the issue is the gated uh, emergency access aspect of this. I think that's what town council was saying is when we have, we would consider that then a, a cul-de-sac and an extension of one. So I think that they are the smaller gated access and with or without that, the town council is looking at as equivalent from his perspective legally. Um, we heard from the fire department that if we have an access, they want it to be to conventional standards. Mm -hmm. So I think that those are two different questions. But I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think town council is telling us that the, the two cul-de-sacs and the two cul-de-sacs with a gated emergency access is equivalently the same thing. If I could just, I'd, where I think, but that only, our inability to waive it only applies to an open space plan, not to a conventional subdivision plan. So once the it's resub... No, no, no. That's, no? That's no. John Gray. Yeah. I'm sorry. So if they submit it as a conventional plan, we do have the ability right. to waive mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. distance. So that's the difference in the council's approach. Is there anything really stopping us from going with the conventional plan um, with easements that, you know, that, are, that are granted to the town? I mean, we could... We could have easements that are granted to the town to preserve the open space aspect that we all like, but comply with our our, our bylaws and have the, you know have the gated access in the conventional plan. You understand what I'm saying? The conventional plan. I guess it's more a question for the applicant. I'm sorry. The conventional plan is submitted. It was got the cut through road. Right. Correct. Right. So that's what you're. Well, I'm saying if if if. Town Council is saying that we can't have the gated access under the open space plan. Right. Now we're going back to the conventional plan. Now right? you can resubmit the same plan that was submitted for open space, but submit it as a conventional plan. Only if we have denied the special permit. Only if we deny the special permit. And by the granting of the donation of the, for lack of a better term, open space that was going to be granted under the open space that could be considered by us an exceptional circumstance to then allow us to provide the waiver mm -hmm. to the, the two cul-de-sacs. So I think we're, what we're saying, you are I think correct. We're the same thing. We're saying the same thing. It's just they don't have to provide any but they'll actually donate the land the same as they would under an open mm -hmm. space plan. So on the ground, it's we still get the open space. Right, right, right. Right. And um, I don't have much else to add to what's already been said, but to, to echo, um, certainly would be in favor of um, looking at it as an exceptional circumstance. Okay. And if I can just hop in, I'm a great believer that if you buy a house by an airport and they're extending the runway, you know, that's um, one thing. But I am a great believer that if you bought a house, and I don't think anybody here thought two years ago this was a possibility. So I think anything that really interferes with uh, 
the value of your house and your enjoyment of your house, we should look at everything that's necessary to protect that. And I think in discussions that um, we've all come to the, I think a similar conclusion on our own uh, in trying to figure out how to work through the system to make it work. So I would be in favor of it. I would be in favor of at a width for a vehicle, and I know we have, I see our firemen here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just a great believer in you should have two exits out of your house and a fire. And if there's a storm or something like that, so a, a something wide enough gated for an emergency, because if there's a storm and a tree down, you're at the end of the cul-de-sac and you've got a heart attack and the ambulance can't get through, at that point everybody's gonna say, you know, why didn't we do it? So just as a safety precaution, I think what was proposed with the gates, you know, makes sense. But I think we're, uh, I think there's preponderance of the members of the board would look favorably and look at it as the donation of the land as an exceptional circumstance to provide the Talking weapons. a little parking area for those trails for the Upper Charles Trail Committee and they'll be thrilled. <clears throat> they sent a letter supporting and very very uh, positive about the, the trails and, and so forth. So um, yes. So back to the audience, does anybody have any thoughts that they would like to share at this point? Hi, Patrick Fauché, uh, 39 Chamberlain. First of all, I just want to thank the committee and thank Mr. Mastriani and his team for really sticking to this. Uh, we have to work through the procedural issues and I really do commend you. You know where we stand as the neighborhood coalition. We've been on the sidewalks. Um, so. Uh, we'll continue to work with you and, and be so, as supportive as we can. One other aspect that's interesting just occurred to me. This is really exceptional because if you were to look at this plan without either Whalen or Chamberlain, what if it was just a plan to develop the end of Chamberlain? It would not be permissible, but there would be a waiver process. It would be a huge extension. The neighborhood is going to be impacted just if it were that. Same goes for Whalen. If it was just an extension of Whalen for that same piece of property without Chamberlain involved, it would be a huge extension and require waivers. And yes, there'd still have to be cooperation among the parties. So I think we're saying let's continue that. Let's not let bureaucratic procedure interfere with common sense. Thanks. I saw a young man's hand. Go ahead. You come right up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so the pro proper procedure is to identify yourself and your address and then tell us what you'd like to tell us. Yes, um, ironically, I am the son of Patrick Crochet that just spoke. <laughs> <laughs> I live on 39 Chamberlain as well. And your name? My name is Atticus Fauchet, and um, I have a short speech that I will add on to, but I can... I have to ask you, the two cul-de-sacs and the emergency access um, only, I think the emergency, with the emergency access will be the best choice and the safest choice uh, that we could have. Plus the two cul-de-sacs would preserve more wetlands than the cut through. And um, my mother's theory that I believe in is that, um, <coughs> that if we have the cut through, it will tempt drivers to speed down the road unsafely. And, uh, and I think that the two cul-de-sacs with, with the emergency accents would be the best choice. But for the emergency access, will there be like someone like there to open the gate or will you have to like state your emergency to, to go through that? Because if, if there's an open gate, then drivers will just use that as like the cut through. And that would not be good because it's for emo emergencies only. Because if everyone using, because if everyone is using that, that gate, since it's open and un unguarded, that when there's a real emergency, they can't get through in time because there might be like too much traffic there 
or like there might be a crash because someone was speeding, as I said earlier. And um, what I what I really think is that we have to we have to um, think about the safety of the road and the town, and also the safety of the people who live on the street, aka me and my family. Because I mean, I. I personally, I love to play on the street, and I would hate for it, hate to lose that because before I lived on Chamberlain, we moved here, we moved here a year ago. But before I lived on Chamberlain, we lived on 61 Elm Street, and it was a busy road. You couldn't play on the street. You couldn't ride your bike up and down the street. You couldn't take a lovely bike rides, walk down up the street, up and down the street, walk to your neighbors. Um, uh, go to their parties right across the street, swim in their pools that they invited you, because you could barely get across and you couldn't play the, in the street with them. And gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you that there is a time limit. Okay. First, first, I'm gonna tell you that I really appreciate that you're here, and I'm very impressed with your ability to stand up and share your thoughts with us. Thank you. If you had other points you want to make, I want to invite you to wrap it up and make your points. Well, this is pretty much me wrapping it up. So <laughs> that's what I wanted to spit out there because I I feel like I have an emotional connection to the street, and I would hate to lose the ability and go back to 61 Elm Street, not be able to play in the road and have the beautiful trees and birds and stuff like that. Alex, I want to thank you again for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you for my time. Yeah. Um, Atticus, I wanted to answer, uh, or have somebody answer your question. I think the proposal for the gated access, if I remember correctly, is that it would only be, it would be electronically opened by emergency responders. Okay. All right. Um, I do want to make sure that we move forward and we uh, take advantage of our CONCOM um, colleagues that are here. I know that we um, had some exceptional circumstances to, to the start of this. So if I could invite um, our CONCOM friends forward, I think that we're going to have to trade places, yep. but definitely uh, we want your participation as we go forward. Sorry about the space constraints. Thank you all for your patience. Good evening, Jeff Barnes. I'm the chair of the Conservation Commission. Melissa Rico is, is a vice chair, and Ed Harrell's a member. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, so I want to open it up to the board um, to ask uh, questions of our CONCON colleagues um, as it applies to the, it's a little bit convoluted now, but as it applies to the special permit application. Um, so I don't know if somebody would like to lead us off. Or well, do you want me to yes. Okay. Yes. So I think that one of the reasons that um, we asked um, the board asked CONCOM members to attend was one of the um, criteria that you have to find in order to grant special permit is that the parcel could be developed as a conventional subdivision under existing local, state, and federal <coughs> land use regulations, which because this property has a significant number of wetlands on it, um, you know, there's the Wetlands Protection Act and the local CONCOM bylaw that would, you know, be affected by this. So I think the board, in order to make that finding, needs some, something to determine whether or not this parcel can meet that. And so I think that's why, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's why you asked them to be this. So does anybody have specific questions or uh, in general, um, I, I personally would like to hear a little bit about from your perspective, the constraints and complications on the parcel, um, all inclusive from your perspective. Um, but I don't know if anybody has a specific question they'd rather start with. I, I think that's a good place to start, Miro, but I'd also just ask as you go through the discussion, look at it maybe both from a conventional perspective, which I believe is five, 
proposed wetland crossing. It's two now, isn't it? But it's down into a special. Um, it's two now. It's, it's two now. Two. Yeah. yeah right. This new this this newest filing is that correct? Is yeah. two wetland two. crossings. Yeah. In, in either plan. Mm -hmm. yeah. In the two. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so first off, we just don't have in front of us an open application. So we had an informal hearing uh, with the applicant and his team a few months ago, and that was for the conventional plan um, as well as the open space development plan um, that we discussed. Uh, we haven't seen the new plan with the two crossings, so I'll speak to uh, the feedback that we gave the applicant with regard to the original conventional plan that was submitted before us and the kind of guidance that we gave them at that time was, and again this was informally, was that it was a high bar um, to get something like that passed, but it was feasible, okay? Um, I mean, five crossings is difficult for us, I think, um, but, you know, not, again, not having the formal application before us, you know, we said, and told the, the applicant and his team, you know, it, it is potentially possible for something like this to get approved, but until we have something formally before us that we can study and look at what the actual impacts are, um, really that's the only guidance we can give them at that point in time. Um, I think from the standpoint of this new plan, and you know, I haven't looked at it, but certainly two crossings um, is a lower bar than five crossings. Uh, so I think that that is something that the commission, uh, you know, again, potentially could permit. Um, but the overarching feedback that we gave to the applicant at the time was the Conservation Commission really is in favor of the open space development plan. You know, we like to see a portion of the property set aside for open space under a permanent conservation restriction. Uh, a, um, you know, de minimis effect on impacts to resource areas. Um, any mitigation uh, for resource areas that are impacted and you know other types of things such as trails and you know trail signage and and you know those items so those are all factors that come into our consideration when we approve these types of projects so i don't know if the vice chair or mr harrow has anything to add to that so one thing that i was particularly concerned about I'm sorry, oh, go ahead. <laughs> one thing i was uh, particularly concerned about was the vernal pool and at least from the from the appearance on the plans, it looks as though the topography is showing that we we have a wetland above the crossing, at least on this this picture here, and um, and that seems to be feeding that vernal pool uh, below it. And uh, my concern, uh, and I'd like to hear some feedback on you know what you think the impact on the vernal pool would be if we're cha if we're adding the um, adding the crossing and you know temperature and those type of uh, impervious surface are we going to flood it are we going to you know what's going to happen there or would you share that concern I mean the actual impact on the vernal pool um, again is, is really you know difficult for us to comment on unless we have something before us that we've looked at mm -hmm. I will say that when we do permit these types of projects, uh, when there is a resource area such as a vernal pool and there's a crossing for a wetland, the commission takes a very hard look at uh, what is being proposed and we attempt to mitigate any impact um, to those resource areas, whether it's a vernal pool, a stream, uh, a wetland. Um, so, uh, you know, I would say that as part of our approval process, um, when the application does come before us, that's something that the commission and our consultants would look at, um, and we would make sure that what was being proposed 
um, wouldn't have uh, any significant you know uh, adverse impacts to those resource areas didn't, didn't that come up at the site visit um, I thought of one of the site visits when you guys talked about what type of mitigation plans that you would put in place uh, with regards to both crossings or was I not was I dreaming could I respond? Yeah, so, so through the chair, Scott Goddard, Goddard Consulting, Wetlands Consultant for REC Hopkinton. And I've been on this project now for, for many years and familiar with the property intimately. I've been visited with this, with this board and the prior board. And the Conservation Commission is familiar with me for working with Hopkinton for the last 20 years as a private consultant. So let me, if I can just quickly recap you know where we left off at the commission so for the benefit of the more board members from the commission who are here as well the this is Chamberlain this is the conventional roadway going all the way through to Wayland the crossings that we discussed last time primarily that that gave access into this upland area over here which we have now eliminated so now there's no longer a crossing you know in here in here we just have the one road going all the way through. So in this current proposal, we only show two wetland crossings. One is going to be right here, and that's at the end of Wayland, Wayland Road. The commission may have looked at this. I know at least their agent has seen this when we reviewed this site under the wetland delineation confirmation process. That's going to be 1,100 square feet and there's an existing stream crossing already in place. There's a large corrugated metal pipe that was an overbuild from this McBride extension over here. So there's a pipe that comes all the way through in here and then wetlands adjacent to it. So that there, we're gonna be in a pretty good position to make a stream improvement to the, and opening up some of the current culverted stream. So we'll be able to daylight some stream channel in there and have to replicate some bordering vegetated wetlands. So that's 1,100 square feet. The bigger one is the center one in here. And under the conventional layout, which was what you see here, we estimate that to be approximately uh, 5,000 square feet in size. But the total size of that will be a function of how we end up in this whole emergency access versus conventional road layout. But nevertheless, the combination of the two crossings here and here will exceed 5,000 square feet. The previous iterations having crossings down in here and in here are now gone, so our number is, is significantly less than uh, what we presented to the commission several months ago under the prior iteration. We also reduced the lots now from 35 down to 32, so there's an overall uh, reduction in the upland area impacts as well. Now, as far as the regulations go, both Hopkinton's bylaw and the Wetland Protection Act, it does permit the alteration of wetlands, and that alteration is not capped at 5,000 square feet when you have what's called a limited crossing project. Limited crossing project means that, that it exceeds the normal capacity of the wetland regulations. In this particular case, that normal capacity of what the regulations allow is a 5,000 square feet. So we're going to be asking for the commission alter, to alter over 5,000 square feet. DEP under their regulations 310 CMR 10.58E, 53E rather, and the commission's familiar with that. That's the, the limited project crossing provisions. It stipulates that the commission may allow access to upland areas not otherwise reachable through upland means but via a wetland crossing. And that's driven by the requirements of the local planning board. The Conservation Commission also has a policy that they are familiar with, which is Wetlands Policy 88-2. 88 meaning it was, it was a policy written by the DEP in 1988, and it was the second one of that year. It's, it's, re, it's called access roadways, and it's inter an interpretation of the limited crossing provisions. It's particularly relevant to this discussion, so I think it would be helpful if I just highlighted a few key excerpts from that explanatory provision for the benefit of the planning board, but specifically you know, addressing it to the Conservation Commission. I won't read the whole thing. It's about two pages long. I'll read maybe a, a paragraph or two. The purposes of the limited crossing provisions is to allow projects in which wetlands will be crossed with a new roadway to provide access to otherwise unreachable upland areas. 
In this program policy, the DEP elaborates on the analysis that should be applied when determining whether a new roadway qualifies for consideration as a limited project. It goes on to say that it must satisfy the general requirements under the regulations and then it's, whether it's appropriate to grant the exception of the provisions under 1054 to 1057, that is bank, land underwater body, BBW, which is what we have in this particular case. Then it says um, a project satisfies the general requirements for a limited project roadway if the issuing authority determines no reasonable alternative means of access from a public way to uplands of the same owner is available. And it goes through to discuss a little bit more in detail that you have to consider abutting ownership, uh, reasonably access uh, available property to obtain, that type of thing. And then the probably the most critical paragraph and the final one that I'll read discusses the Planning Board's jurisdiction in light of the Conservation Commission regulations. It says, for projects subject to a Planning Board jurisdiction, the issuing authority, and in this case when it says the issuing authority, it's referring to the Commission because this is addressed to the Commission. The issuing authority must also determine whether the new roadway or driveway is the minimum length and width acceptable to the Planning Board. Therefore, the issuing authority may require the applicant to request the planning board to formally rule on revisions to the project which would protect wetlands even if approvable of the right, uh, even if approval of the regulation uh, revisions would require the planning board to apply variance provisions that allow the board to waive or vary its standard requirements. The issuing authority, again that's the commission, should only determine that no reasonable alternative means of access are available after the applicant has made a good faith effort to identify alternate means of access and has actually presented any reasonable alternatives to the planning board and received that board's ruling. This provision does not preclude the possibility, and this is an important sentence in the last one, this provision does not preclude the possibility of more than one wetland crossing in certain circumstances such as where an applicant is developing a very large parcel of land and the planning board has required after a review of alternatives as discussed above the applicant to provide multiple access points into the property. So in other words, the, the planning board's procedures sort of drives what the Conservation Commission is um, able to review. And ultimately, if the planning board concludes that properties must have two points of access, then the commission will be forced to evaluate two points of access as driven by the planning board process. It will also require us as the applicant's representatives and team to come before the planning board seeking a, any ability to waive or consider shrinking such as this emergency access, either eliminating it altogether or reducing its width so that we can present to the Conservation Commission that we've made every reasonable effort under good faith to show a reduction of wetland impacts. So in this particular case, by having two crossings instead of five, I actually believe that we have shown even a, a, a less aggressive plan that the, than otherwise the limited crossing provisions might allow. I think the other, the other project is still something that is permissible, but this is something that I think is even more palatable under the regulations, both bylaw and state law, because that policy that I read is referring to state law, although there's a significant overlap under local bylaws. With respect to the vernal pool, and that was a question that came up by one of the board members, this 125 foot buffer zone around its perimeter is a buffer zone set forth in Hopkinton's local uh, bylaw that does not exist under state law. And we're not proposing to have any alteration within that area. As far as feeding it and such like this, uh, with a stream channel. That's something that we're looking at, we'll look at with the Conservation Commission. We're required to provide ap ap appropriate culverting to allow the water to not be backed up, or we cannot increase or decrease the water flow to the vernal pool. So we want to protect adequately the, the upland and wetlands surrounding the vernal pool as, wa as well as the water feeding the vernal pool. So we'll have to demonstrate to the Conservation Commission satisfaction that we have protected that vernal pool. So in conclusion, I believe as a professional that the project here, though the, though the commission I don't think can say it is something they would or will approve, it is certainly, certainly something that the regulations allow an avenue that it can be or could be approved were we to demonstrate that in, in a full application. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm a little bit mindful of the time. Um, I, I want to ask the Conservation Commission members to um, respond or react to that whole presentation if they had something they wanted to add. 
I would, um, you know, I would agree that, uh, you know, it looks like at face value here, this is something that, you know, potentially could be approved. Again, that's not looking at it too deeply. You know, it's basically just the overview that we got and, you know, some of the uh, um, feedback that Mr. Goddard had and information that Mr. Goddard had presented. Um, but certainly this is more palatable than five wetland crossings. Um, I will say that. And, you know, again, I just want to emphasize that we don't have anything in front of us. We haven't had our consultants look at it. We haven't been presented with an alternative analysis. Uh, we haven't looked at cumulative impacts. You know, those are all factors that, you know, come into the fold when you know, we look at these projects. And we just, you know, don't have the benefit uh -huh. of an open application and any of that information in front of us. So. Does anybody on the board have any comments or questions at this point? Sir? I do have a question, but I think you may not be able to answer it. Um, do you have any comments or thoughts on the number of lots, is, if 32 lots is feasible on this plan? Or, or you haven't really had a chance to review it yet, so Unfortunately, you we, you know, we just don't know. <coughs> other than the two wetland crossings, we are in compliance with all of the other um, wetland or conservation commission bylaws. Is that correct, Scott? From Yes, no, none of the houses or septic systems are proposed within such close proximity to the wetlands that they would be in, in non-compliance with Hopkinson's local bylaws. So we believe that the way this is laid out, it's laid out in a way that, again, other than the wetland crossings themselves, all of the provisions of the Hopkinson's bylaw are respected. And, and, that's the, and just to, uh, that's the opinion of the consultant, that's not an opinion of the Conservation Commission, just to make that point. I appreciate that a lot. Um, did you have another follow-up? Yeah, I'm all set. I had, um, and we only have a couple of more minutes, but I had a, a question about sort of the global impact on the entire property. What are the implications um, of a single owner or developer um, in consideration of the impacts across the entire property, not just this piece that's considered for development? Right, and that gets back to um, the point that I made a few minutes ago where we look at cumulative impact. Um, so that is uh, um, another aspect of not only this project but other projects that may be developed or have been developed in the area under common ownership. Um, we look at that as well. And even outside of the wetlands regulations and wetlands bylaw, there is a cumulative <laughs> impact analysis that's required for this uh, joint ownership so going lumping in the muse project and the development up lumber street both under mepa as well as under when you exceed 5,000 square feet we have to l now look at army corps of engineers jurisdiction with uh, uh, the wetlands impacts and also under dep's 401 water quality certificate provisions so we have three other sets of sort of regulatory oversights to exceeding 5,000 square feet that are, I believe, all permissible on this project but do come into the project, but they all three of those look at cumulative impact. So the crossing that was required to access the Muse property, which was 762 square feet, that cumulatively gets looked at with this six or so, so thousand square feet of wetland filling as well. And just for clarification, that is true um, however we develop it, if it's through the open space bylaw or if that is denied Correct. through a conventional plan. Yes. And we, when we look at all the um, already approved as I'm, well as the potential. Can, can I just ask you, for the folks at home, if you're able to stand up for a microphone thing. I'm oh, sorry. I just, just know nobody can hear you at home. Okay. Sorry. Just speaking to the cumulative uh, to further define and put a rough number around it. When we look at what's already been approved for the MUSE and then even talking about all the potential that we've mentioned here, we're still at over the 200 acres that Mr. Mastrioni owns, which is the, 100, the initial 100 acres that was approved on the master plan and the 100 acres we're talking here. We're less than 1% of wetlands impact across the entire 200 acres. And we haven't presented that formally, but just to give you a rough gauge that it is minor overall in the grand scheme. Thank you. 
Um, we are at the time in our agenda where we move, need to move on to um, another uh, another matter. Um, so I entertain a motion. Do we have a time set for this? We could continue it to 7.30 on August 14th. So I'll entertain a motion to continue this hearing to, uh, the, you just said it, 7.30 on August 14th. August 14th. I move to continue the hearing to 7.30 on August 14th. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Could I? Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Let me just make a comment. Yeah. We have the ability at that time, and correct me if I'm wrong, to look and say we're continuing the open space hearing through the rest of the agenda, the rest of the outline, and then vote at that point. Or if we feel, based on what's presented already, that we have the ability to say yes or no, then we could, at that time, shorten the process so we come back and if, if the, the majority of the board feels that can make a decision one way or the other. So mm -hmm. theoretically, if based on ConCon's comments that is unable to determine the number of houses, as an example, uh, again theoretically and the fact that we have council mm -hmm. statement in a theoretical situation that if we feel permits us to turn it down we could then turn down the open space without going through the rest of the outline mm -hmm. right so I just want to do that just to let people know that that is a potential mm -hmm. and a decision the board will make at the next meeting but it may not we may not go through the whole outline. Um, can I, before we vote, can I also add, um, is there um, interest in support from town council that we would make sure was available to the public if we got it um, about the precedence issue? Are we expecting town council to rule on that prior to the next meeting? I'm just asking if we want to ask that question prior to the next meeting. Well, if I can, anything we do sets precedence. Yes. So town council will basically say that, but then you differentiate based on unique circumstances. So I think if we're looking at our comfort level and setting precedence, um, that's up to each each of us on the board, but I think if somebody desired to say it's limited precedence, we've had a lot of testimony and comments that this is a very unique situation. I'm, I'm totally fine and, and based on that. But anything we do do sets a precedent, so if somebody comes up with the same situation, connecting roads, wetlands crossing, with everything else, then yes, we have set the precedents, but the chances of that happening are, are probably something that we have to determine is a risk we may want to take. I'm comfortable with that. Did you have a comment you wanted to make? I, I think it's been answered. My okay. question was, what are the next steps? <laughs> yeah. okay. We understand. Okay. Um, okay. You know, what's going to happen at the next meeting, and then it sounds like there'll be a decision forthcoming from that. Yes. We can decide then what, the, what we need to resubmit. Is there, is there anything more that the planning board would like to hear from the conservation commission on this matter? So I think that um, the reality, the the you know elephant in the room, I might as well just paint it, so we see the reality is we don't really have enough information because the concom hasn't received a, a filing. So I think we understand as much as possible that we can understand, and we understand that um, this filing has not gone formally before the concom, and this is. This is as much as we can know until you have a formal filing. Correct. So I think, as far as I'm concerned, I think we've we've beaten that particular horse. Well, we appreciate you yeah, guys totally. coming in. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, right. Very much. Thanks, um, so uh, all those in favor of, of continuing the hearing to 7:30 August 14th. Look at that. I'm, I'm out the 14th. But You're what? I'm out. So yeah, but you will. Um, watch it I'll definitely watch because it because we're you know <laughs> maybe, maybe <I laughs> we're dwindling should, uh, maybe I should uh, <laughs> dial in
I mean, the Cubs game, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that brings up a point that Cliff and Frank have to watch it to part. If yes. There's going to be a vote made that night, and yes. Fran is not here. No, That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Right. Well, actually, okay. we have seven now because yeah. of the fun game, so we're good. Okay, so we're good. Okay. Okay. Oh, all right. All right. Yeah. Thank you for okay. that, though. I appreciate yeah. that. All right. I think we're ready for a vote. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Thank guys. Thank you. Tip your way. <laughs> Good night. I needed this. Oh, those were extra. <laughs> well done. I think it's a good job. Yes, thanks. Everybody, you guys are awesome. I think I'll have a console thing. We did. Yeah. 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 I mean, could we do that by email? Because I'm obviously like the... That would be a question for Jennifer. No, I'm going to talk about it because I would, uh, I would have... Uh, it has to be an open meeting. Okay. Hey. <laughs> Another controversial matter. <laughs> Proposed minor amendment to the approved site plan, 13 Main Street. The proponent is the uh, permanent oh. building committee and the town engineer. <laughs> and I know how those permanent building committee people are. Like a bad oh, no, I'm All set. All set. Mr. Uh, Chair. For the record, uh, Dan McIntyre of the permanent building committee. Uh, we're here tonight to request a minor site plan modification to install an emergency generator at the library project. Uh, during construction, we encountered uh, quite a bit more groundwater than we had anticipated. Uh, if you remember, during the, uh, well, I don't think anybody was on the planning board at that time, but maybe, maybe John it was. When we went through the initial site plan review, we uh, made the basement of the library much bigger. So we can Give me one second. Can yeah. we just not have conversations behind us, please? I'm sorry. Conversations outside unless. We made, we made the basement of the library much bigger to reduce the mass of the, uh, of the exterior of the library. Um, so when we got into construction, we encountered the groundwater. We decided to put in a, a permanent sump pump in the basement, which led to the question, what happens when electricity goes out? Uh, so we'd like to put in an emergency generator. Uh, on the site. Uh, the location we chose would be directly behind the uh, church part of the, uh, the old church part of the library, um, which is basically behind the library. It's a, it's a small residential type generator. If I, if I may. This, this generator is very similar in appearance. We're putting in a different main foot. It's very similar to that. What's Probably about four feet wide by two and a half feet tall. Very similar to an AC unit. Yeah. Is that very similar to an air conditioning unit? Yes. Size wise. Yes. And the size of the uh, generator and kilowatt looked like it was 14. Uh, that sounds familiar. Yeah. And it's a Kohler. It's a Kohler generator. We've got, it uh, says here 17 kW. Okay, 17. Yep. So just as a, if I can help you out a little bit, I have a 20 kW Kohler natural gas generator for the house. And it is probably at this point three years old. And it is very quiet. It's probably the amount. Nobody knows it's a generator because everybody expects, you know, everybody expects a lawnmower. And in effect, what it sounds like is if you were outside a house that had a window air conditioner unit in it, it's, it is very quiet and, and mine's larger uh, than that is. So from a, a noise point of view and obtrusive it's really I have sat, stood with people on my lawn 
with it in view. And it's like, you have central air conditioning. What is that, another air conditioner? I said, no, it's the generator. So it, it is quiet. So my, oh, go ahead. so my main concern was the noise, too, because it's very close to the homes. Um, and so is it only being used during emergencies, like when the power goes out, or does it really run on a weekly cycle all year? Or? Well, it's, it has to be tested. So, so it's going to be running on a weekly cycle for about 20 minutes. So once a week, 20 minutes. And we, and we can time that for any time. It's usually during the middle of the day uh, when they do that operational testing. Okay. And then could you describe how it's going to be screened from the neighboring homes? You said it wouldn't be visible from the homes. Right. Well, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be visible because it's such a low-profile unit. Um, and the, the direct neighbors, there's already a fence there. Um, but, but their bedroom windows would be above. You know, they can look down over the fence, I think, right? Yeah, it's hard to say. I know the Hadleys, their house is set pretty close to Hayden Row Street. I don't know if she'll be able to see that. Uh. She's right here. Oh, she can. Oh, how are you doing? <laughs> We, we did send out a notice to the abutters oh, that's that great. we're coming okay. tonight so they know. Uh, and she, she can ask her own questions, I'm sure. Okay. I just have one. Okay. Any further? I, I don't have anything further. No. Any um, further comment one. from the board? And then we'll, we'll call Just it. one quick question. Um, what's it powered by? Is it gas, diesel? Uh, natural, natural gas. Any other questions from answer mine? You want to come up, identify yourself and your address? Hi, I'm Sue Hadley for Hayden Row. I am a direct butter. Um, so the unit is on site. It is a small box, and it does seem to have um, sound pr soundproofing cover mm -hmm. built into it. So our question um, was really the exact location and how far it was going to be from the property line, and Dan sent an email um, alerting us to this meeting on Friday, um, and we did, I did get some qu answers, but just wanted to make sure that it's gonna be closest to, as far away from our property as possible, um, and that it would not have any impact on the natural screenings that are supposed to be going up in between. That's really my only questions. Yeah, right, right now we've got it located about 10 feet from her property line, uh, and we do have some screening that was proposed as part of the site plan review, and it won't affect that at all. We'll still be putting in that screening. So I, I'm glad you asked about the um, cycling, because I did not, I thought it was just for the emergency, which is what you had said, but if that's 20 minutes once a week during the middle of the day, that's nothing. Okay. And if I can add to that, it's 20 minutes, but 10 minutes is cool down. <laughs> so it's the, the, even the, the higher noise level is only for 10 minutes. And it is a and residential a unit. Cool we went, you yep. know, right. and in, in the materials we got, it said something about a be between a conversational tone and some other low level audible tone but for the sound. Okay. It would be, it, it was, there was some, there was yeah. some detail that it would be very, very. Right you know, inconsequential noise impacting. Totally fine. As long as it doesn't in impact the plantings, um, that was our biggest concern. Well, and yeah. well, whether it's, it's full-time. It's, full it's, time. it's a, quiet at all. It's right. quiet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm fine. The, the unit itself, luckily, is manufactured because it is a residential unit. It is. With all the sound attenuation, yes, yes. you know, the in the structure. Is. Mm -hmm. So I think that helps a tremendous amount on the fact that it's natural gas also oh. cuts it down more. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Just a comment. I think we have to decide whether it's a minor or major. Yes. So the so feedback I would give to that is that it seems minor to me. Okay. So what we need is we have to make two determinations. One is it uh, qualify as a, a minor modification. Uh, just for those, if it's not considered a minor modification, we have to, it's a major, uh, we need to schedule a new hearing and notices have to go out, et cetera. Um, and then if we do say it's a minor modification, then we can take a vote on approving it or not. So 
Uh, so do you want to take that as a motion? Yeah, I would make a motion to say that it's a minor modification. Second. Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? So carry. And then if someone wants to make a motion to approve? So moved. Is that a second? Uh, any discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? So carried. With the existing conditions in the site plan still intact? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Look at this on schedule. <laughs> Back on schedule, 745. You want to start with this? As the, <laughs> this is we, we just, uh, for those who don't know, we have project <coughs> liaison, and we won't mention anybody's name Jennifer. who <laughs> uh, didn't mention to Fran. So Fran has volunteered with just the preparation that we all do uh, to uh, be project liaison on the next public hearing. All right, um, so this is a um, public hearing for the site plan review for 5060 West Main Street, uh, the application from Golden Pond. So can the applicants come on up and uh, provide an overview of what you're looking for? And do we need to open the hearing? Jennifer, do we need to open the public hearing? Is it already open? Yes. I will make a motion to open the public hearing. Second. Moved and seconded. <coughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. It is now a public hearing. Oh. And since I had discussed this, I'm afraid to know. Just this is a beta response. Uh, that we're receiving t today. So, uh, Ada is the consultant for the town. All right. Gentlemen, the floor is yours. <coughs> you're going to ask the principal planner? You get it. Oh. Uh, we have a principal planner? Joe, right? <coughs> Jennifer. Oh, Jennifer. I'm sorry. Jennifer? Yes. Provide an overview, please, if you would. Um, yeah, I don't have a big overview on this tonight. Um, this is phase three of the Golden Pond project. Um, phase one has been done. Phase two is, I think, under, or mostly done. We're a little bit under construction now. Yeah. So this is phase three. It's, um, then before the design review board, those comments were provided to you. They didn't have any comments. Um, you know, it's there's usually you ask me what could they have done? What can they do by right? You know, because this is a commercial site, there's they need site plan review, so they have to be here before you tonight. Um, other than that, I don't really have anything else to add. This is a pretty, pretty minor one. They're not doing any landscape, any to speak of, or any lighting or any parking changes it's all really building addition okay. but they can speak to that all right guys good evening mr chairman my name is wayne davies i'm an attorney in milford and i represent golden pond tonight um, we're here before you on phase three of our uh, project um, this uh, construction um, idea and, and uh, project started back in 2008 and uh, the uh, Golden Pond received approval from the Board of Appeals in December of 2009 under a phased project. Uh, phase two was completed uh, within uh, a few years thereafter, and phase three uh, has now commenced. Uh, the use is a continuing care retirement community. Um, the application itself contains uh, quite a bit of information on the specific uses and how they're allowed under the current zoning bylaws. And uh, the principal planner in, in her uh, comments uh, indicate that uh, uh, the proposed use is, is uh, in conformity with the zoning bylaws. Phase three uh, expands on the continuing care retirement uh, community use uh, with a 34,100 square foot building uh, with uh, 54 additional beds. 
Uh, tonight with us is Carrie Kuntz, who is uh, Vice President of the Golden Pond uh, Resident Care Corporation, uh, Joe Marcadant, our engineering expert, and a uh, architect from the De, Gir De, De Girio, uh firm, who will also uh, address the board. Um, I'd like to have my uh, um, client uh, just have some preliminary comments to the board uh, at this time, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Kerry Quince, uh, one of the principal owners of Golden Pond, along with my brother, uh, Larry Quince. 25 years ago this summer, we embarked upon the initial construction of Golden Pond. Over the last 25 years, Hopkinton has changed a lot, evolved, and so have we. And we've continued to provide care, as most of you know, for that part of our population which oftentimes is looked upon as elderly, frail, uh, and requires assistance. Along the way, we've discovered other sections of our society that need assistance also, and so we branched out into a variety of different uh, levels and kinds of care for different uh, residents that, that have now become part of the Hopkinton community that are as young as their mid-40s. Um, as Wayne said, we're now at uh, the, the third and last phase of the expansions that we're doing at Golden Pond, and we're trying to provide uh, a level of uh, apartments that are in between some of what we did in the last phase, which were larger, more luxurious uh, units, and what was originally there, and these are more um, single bedrooms and studio type of apartments. Along with that, we're uh, providing uh, an increased amount of uh, common space areas where we can provide a, a, a growing amount of uh, amenities that our, our residents uh, enjoy, both uh, creating an area where we can hold concerts and um, all types of uh, stage productions and things, as well as a state-of-the-art fitness center and a wellness center as people continue to age in place at Golden Pond. It's been a privilege of my brother and myself to be a part of Hockington, and we look forward to uh, many more years being part of this community as we go forward. So I thank all of you for your time and consideration, because I know it's a volunteer job for all of you, or investment for all of you, and I share the, the passion for making Hockington a better place for all of us. So thank you for all being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to now uh, have Joe Marcadon address the board. Evening, folks. Joe Marcadon, part of the design team um, for this project. As Attorney Davies mentioned a moment ago, this is a culmination of a, a process that we started in 2009. And um, given the tenor of where things were, some zoning changes hadn't taken place yet, uh, some of the issues with other boards in town needed to be resolved. We felt it was prudent back in 2010 to uh, try and obtain um, an approval and a, I guess, a path forward for the entire um, area. Um, it's a 10-acre parcel. Number 50 was the original building, uh, circa 88, 89. Um, we decided as we went through it, we would approach all the boards about uh, planning all the infrastructure needs. Uh, the second driveway cut from West Main Street, all the parking that we need through phases two and three. So 129 spaces, even though we, we received relief for 14 from the, um, the Board of Appeals, 115 is what we need, but 129 spaces were built. Um, at the request of the DPW, we upgraded uh, municipal water. Uh, we created a closed loop, uh, upgraded the capacity at the site. We, we brought in uh, upgraded power to satisfy the needs of, uh, of the future construction, uh, made a sewer connection into, well, into West Elm Street, um, solidified that. So a lot of things that were part of what would normally pop up here tonight, I think we've kind of covered. I don't want to minimize that. I certainly don't want to minimize your input. But I just thought I'd take a second to try and touch on all those. Um, we have... Um, a closed drainage system that collects stormwater, takes it down to uh, the northerly corner of the site. Um, we have in our original design the LID techniques, um, the stormwater management 
different uh, ideas that uh, the state has, has been promoting. Um, we have fire access between um, phase two, the lodges, the constructed area, and the lofts, phase three, which I've highlighted in red on the sketch over there. Um, we've tried to assimilate the concerns of um, the former chief, uh, fire chief, the former police chief in, in all of our designs. Um, we've, we had a plan for landscaping. Um, there were concerns raised about the westerly and southerly sides of the site. Um, landscape materials were installed, fences went up, wooden fences went up to screen the project um, from some of the neighbors. Um, site lighting, uh, all the pole mounted lights went in in 2012, uh, baller lighting along the walks. I think all we're really anticipating is some um, some baller lighting along the existing walk on the westerly side, and then some building mounted light packs over the doorways for uh, safety reasons. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, the, um, the power has been upgraded. Um, what wasn't incorporated in all of those designs, um, and it was really a, a back and forth with the Conservation Commission, simply because of timing. They took the lead on the review of the stormwater back in 2009. Um, we got to them first. We're using the same uh, peer review consultant. So they went through the stormwater before the, the planning board did. And what they asked us was if we could not finalize the designs on phase three at that time, to remove them from the discussion. We had a general building, but nothing more than that. We had a rectangle on the plan. So what wasn't incorporated in all of that examination of the stormwater, uh, where we had the parking, we had the driveways, we had the walkways, we didn't have the phase three building. So what we have had to do in this, and it's the biggest reason that we're here before all the groups, is to expand that basin in the northerly corner of the site. Um, increased rooftop, increased impervious area, we need increased area within the basin to, uh, to mitigate the impacts from that. So our basin gets slightly larger because of it. Um, And the, yes, and the rest of it is, is stuff that, uh, that we have discussed. We still handle uh, rate and volume of flow with our basin. Um, we're still uh, in line with, we feel in line with DEP's stormwater checklist. So we think we're headed in the right direction. Um, we have started the process with uh, the other groups in town. We saw a design review back June 20th at a very productive meeting uh, with those folks. Um, not much uh, input was necessary on the plans. We received a lot of, uh, there's a lot of discussion, but not many real changes to the, the uh, planet because of that. We went June 26th to the Conservation Commission, uh, held a hearing for those folks. Um, they had continuous out till next Monday night, 31st. I think they want real answers on what the peer review, what Peter Group Inc thinks of the uh, decision we made regarding stormwater. Our basin is down within the buffer zone. Changes to the size of that basin will be of real interest to the Conservation Commission. Um, we did receive a, a letter from Beta Group of Peer Review uh, dated June 26th. We, in an attempt to try and move this process forward in a positive manner, put together some um, changes, some revisions. Uh, the June, uh, July 17th revision date, excuse me. I think we fell, we fell to the bugaboo of vacation times. I'm not sure that um, we got it out late because of some folks in our office were out. Um, <coughs> Beta, I think, has just come back with a review of those revisions. We have not had a chance to study those. But there is a, a, an attempt on our part to try to get on the same page with Beta regarding a lot of these issues. I'd be happy, that's obviously a very brief outline. I'd be happy to discuss any of the issues in more in depth if you if you'd like to. I think one of the things that we'll do, so thank you that uh, for the overview from all three of you gentlemen. Uh, one of the things we do use here is an outline, right? So as we go through the outline, Joe, a number of those topics that you briefly touched on, we'll go into some more detail uh, on each of those as we follow the outline. Uh, on its way through. 
<clears throat> the next um, point on that is comments from the planner. Jennifer. Thanks. Um, yeah, so we had a staff meeting last week um, in attendance with myself, the fire chief, the police chief, and the director of public works. Um, conservation agent was on vacation, and the director of land use management was out as well. Um, so we, the, the four of us that were there, uh, were, was able to review the plans and just have a conversation about some items that, some of the issues that just came up just for the board's information is um, the availability of water. Um, DPW is still evaluating that. Um, they said they should know soon, but they're just avail evaluating whether or not the water is available on site for the increased number of beds. Um, I don't want to speak for the fire chief because I know he's in the room, but he had some concerns about um, access um, during construction and where vehicles for the workers will be parking. I guess in previous phases of construction, there's been some issues regarding having full access for the fire trucks and ambulances, emergency vehicles throughout the site. So he just wants the construction management plan to address that aspect of it um, and how it's going to be enforced. Um, he also noted some, you know, things that are more building permit related regarding fire protection calculations for sprinklers and things like that. Um, and then access to the site itself once the construction is over. He's requesting a swept path analysis be done. Um, the DPW director noted that they have to confirm that the internal piping on the site is able to meet the flow for the sewage um, and just confirm that with the Public Works Department. And then both um, fire and police um, just had some concerns about capacity. Um, they're seeing an increase in their calls for emergency calls, um, not only to Golden Palm, but to other newly constructed similar type facilities. And, you know, their capacity is sort of, you know, at capacity at the moment. And so they just want everybody to be aware that it's getting to the breaking point. And I don't know if the chief can speak more to that when it's his turn, but um, that was really, I think, mostly what we talked about. And are some of those issues going to be remediated internally during your staff meetings here, or is um, that something that we need to be addressed? I mean, most here? of them we can address, I think. I mean, the construction management stuff we can address here. The fire protection stuff can be addressed at the building permit stage. Um, the swept path analysis should be addressed here. Um, the capacity issue is an issue, though. I'm not sure who's going to address that. So. Right. There's nothing here that lists capacity. So I know. If, if, if the applicant can permit, I, I, what I'd like to do is, when the time comes uh, further down, to take some time dedicated to you to let the, the uh, municipal services talk about not only what you're doing, but it might be, since you're coming up, it might be a good spot for them to take a few extra minutes, if you'll permit us, to discuss the capacity issue not just related to yours, but just everything going into town, which will help the board as we evaluate further things coming down. So if we have them speak, I don't want you to think that we're zeroing in on, uh, we're taking the opportunity to allow them to give a greater discussion on overall town demands. John, we could actually bring that under number five. Yes. Where it says mm -hmm. other town department comments. Yes. Have Chief and any other departments speak at that point. <clears throat> uh, anything else, Jennifer? Um, I think that's all I have for now. All right. The next order on the docket is consultant review. Oh, I'm sorry. Just one more. I did just uh, in anticipation of potential down the road in your in my memo. There were some just general standard conditions of approval for your review I saw that. that can be um, you know added to or subtracted just for your review. We'll get to that. That's mm -hmm. very helpful. Thank you on that. Mm -hmm. uh, beta group, Phil, like step up to the microphone and name, rank, and serial number. <laughs> for the record. Phil Paradis with Beta Group. Uh, we've been uh, consulting and reviewing this project on behalf of the board. I first want to note that uh, we weren't involved in the project other than on the first two phases. So our, our 
you know, we're, we're on a clean slate in, in some respects, but maybe behind the ball, behind the time and, and others. Um, so generally, uh, many of the comments that were already raised by the department heads, we also had uh, similar comments, so I won't reiterate those. Um, but we did note that the landscaping, the photometric plans were kind of outdated. Um, didn't know if that's a um, concern. Um, again, the emergency access, the water service capacity. Um, we noted that the proposed uh, building is within a couple feet of the existing sewer force main um, and the applicant has um, provided in the response that we just got this week is, is going to relocate that. Um, we still could use some re uh, retaining wall details, um, but I think the uh, most significant aspects, most significant issues that I think uh, is, has been following this project for some time is, is the stormwater um, basin that's located in the rear of the property. Um, it, it, uh, it shows signs that uh, it is uh, constructed below the water, the high water table elevation and or is not um, emptying properly uh, as designed as, a, as an infiltration basin. So we've asked for an, uh, some, some test, uh, test data um, and you know, ha we'll, we'll have to work that through as we work through this process as well as with the Conservation Commission. Um, so other than that, that's a brief outline. Um, and, and just the note, um, the beta, the comments that we received, these are comments from today. The ones I handed you tonight were received today because Phil was gracious enough when he got back from vacation today to review the stuff that he had just received. So that's why you received it today. Yeah, there, there are obviously, as, as always, some technical issues that we'll have to work out with the, with the engineer, um, which I didn't want to necessarily bore you with. but. Uh, but, but those are the major issues. Any questions from board members to Beta regarding the review and outline? What was your question? I'm sorry. Any other questions I'll ask to the board okay. members um, regarding the good place? My only one question I did have was around in terms of next steps working with the proponent through some of those issues? What is the, what is the plan on that? To be honest, I think there's got to be a, a sort of a brainstorming effort to figure out what the issues are with that basin and what possible alternatives to, um, because not, not only does it affect this phase, but it, it, it affects how the, the original uh, design of the system uh, and how it, sh it should be functioning differently than it is now. Yeah. And is that something that you will then take on with the proponent? Uh, I think we should do a... Yeah, I, I mean, know, typically yeah. the board encourages the engineers to talk amongst themselves and do that. So, you know, we could we can give Phil that charge if you want to. Mm -hmm. And if you want me to be involved in those meetings, I'm more than happy to as well. We'll encourage it. <laughs> yeah, I, I th yeah, I think it would be good. We, we typically have, you know, whether it's Don and Jeff and myself okay. work out these kind of issues. Right. Since it's it's concom and planning, Don's back on Thursday. He's away right now, so maybe I can. I don't know if the concom needs it for their meeting on Monday or not, but I can try to set something up either before he gets back or wait till he gets back and talk to him about how he wants to handle it. I'm not sure what the best solution would be. But mm -hmm. We can talk about it. Thanks, Phil. <clears throat> All right. At this point, um, I'd like to ask both the board members as well as open it up to the public. Um, you skipped the five. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, other town department comments? I will start with the chief, because I can eyeball him from here. Thanks for the opportunity. I think Jennifer uh, covered all our comments very well. Working with the, um, the team from Golden Pond, I think the logistics around the occupancy when they're actually doing construction with people occupying the building it tends to be one of the biggest challenges we face other than access so um, what does that mean keeping the uh, fire alarm systems 
active, keeping fire protection systems active, keeping separation between the construction areas and the actual occupancies and beds. It's just it, that type of project, it's a little more challenging. So as much um, involvement they can give us with the planning and involve my fire engineer to try to review what systems remain up or down and make sure we feel that we have adequate protection in place while the building's occupied during the construction. So thanks. You want to talk about capacity at all? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. <clears throat> if you want to discuss uh, for a couple of minutes the, the capacity issue, where you are now, and not related to this project, but just overall to the dam. Sure. Just um, I think the short conversation we had as a staff is um, we've had some unforeseen growth in emergency services in the town, just unrelated to the general population growth. So uh, as I look to the townspeople and the Board of Selectmen and try to give them our best guess of what it takes to provide service for the community, we are currently do about 1,200 medicals a year. Probably the biggest draw from Golden Pond currently is our ambulance work. We have a, a few fire calls a year, but it's mostly ambulance work with them. Um, I reviewed the type of occupancy they may have, it's, it, and it's somewhere between 0.5 and 2, depending on the range of what they anticipate for occupancies of incidents per year per bed. So we did a little bit of evaluation, maybe anywhere from, you know, 25 to 100 plus calls a year additional. All depends on what they end up putting in for occupancy. So it's hard to say right now, but I just try to give a general review. Our ambulance right now, we have one. ALS staffed ambulance. It does about a thousand calls a year. That puts it at about 25 to 30 percent in volume, which is about the capacity of a 911 ambulance. So, just in general, when I work with a town, look at some of the future growth, some of the unanticipated growth we just saw, I need to try to balance that with some staffing. And then, what I see is new facilities coming on, whether we get a little higher um, demand from say, um, assisted living over 55 than we might from a standard residence. So that's just kind of the calculation I'm trying to watch. So you might see me look a little hotter at a facility like this coming in than I would a standard population growth of residents. I think something to consider, though, Mr. Chairman, is the fact that you've got Legacy North, right, coming on board with another 200 units. Uh, I'm sorry. One of the things to consider is over the next, let's call it three to five years, you've got another 200 units coming on board with Legacy North, right? You've got this proposed, which is another 50 plus. Okay. Um, are you at some point considering additional personnel that you'd have to add in order to be able to staff adequately? Some sure. That's needs? that's the conversation. I think I'm just trying to help everybody highlight that there are. 500 units of residencies, 180 units of over 55, that's the legacy north. Um, we had a few surprises that we're reviewing in other areas. We've just had kind of a unexplainable bump in kind of like um, behavioral emergencies, and, and I don't know whether it's a demographic issue or whatnot, and, and um, we've uh, had a few um, new businesses. Um, that came into town that just had a higher level of demand that we would normally do just with standard population growth estimates. Mm. So I'm working with the town manager, the board of selectmen, anybody coming in because I want to be able to serve these unanticipated services as they come in. When somebody calls, they want the ambulance to come. They don't want me to tell them a story why it's not there. So I gotta, <laughs> I gotta work on that. Amen. So that's it. Through the liaison, just as a, I'm facilitating a meeting based on my Milford Regional hat uh, and my involvement there between the chief and I think one of the surprises he was talking about was the Tri-County Urgent Care Facility. And when people come in that probably should have gone to the emergency room show up for urgent care, they're sent from urgent care to the emergency room by ambulance. And that was one of the spikes. So I wanted, I was going to mention later in the meeting, but one of the things I'm facilitating is a meeting between mm -hmm. the uh, director of the urgent care facilities for Tri-County and the chief to talk about projections and growth and, you know, what it means. Probably something that they should have done in notifying the town ahead of time, but I don't think anybody really thought of it. Yep. Thank you. All right. Thank you, chief. Right. Do we have any other town... Uh, representatives in the audience regarding this particular project. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm mindful of time. 815 was our uh, 
drop. I would like, if with your approval, maybe just touch on number six to add any additional um, uh, uh, points to the outline, and I'll offer this up to the board members and then open it up to the general public. And then I think at that point it would be appropriate to uh, maybe close the public hearing on this on this project. Continue. I'll continue. Continue. Sorry, Jennifer. Thank you. <clears throat> but can I just? Uh, one sec. Can I just, uh, oh, if you would open the A15, continue, reopen the A15 hearing and then continue it until the, when this one is finished? I'll make a motion to reopen the continued public hearing for Zero Ash Street Scenic Road permit. Second. Motion second. Um, and discussion? Just, and, to just and to continue it after the conclusion of yeah, this. Right. I'm sorry. Right. Yes, yeah. and after this discussion. This is you. All those in favor? Yep. All those in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Great. It's now open. And postponed. So can I now open it up to the public for, or yeah, there was a comment a by that? Yes. Yes. Um, I just yes, wanted to <clears throat> inquire as to uh, the ability of the applicant to comment on, you know, what, what you're hearing. Um, and I think that's only fair that you hear, you know, our response to, to that, whether it be something from uh, Joe Mark and I or myself. Um, I do have a comment on the capacity issue. Uh, Please. You know, as the board is, is aware, site plan review is a um, review of construction of a permitted use. And um, this use was permitted by the town of Hopkinton through the Board of Appeals in 2009. So I, I, when I hear comments that are directed towards that use which is already permitted, um, I have concerns. Um, I think capacity was discussed uh, or should have been discussed in 2009 before the Board of Appeals. And, and I say this very respectfully to this board. Um, the capacity is a use issue, and that's outside the jurisdiction. Um, you know, this is a permitted use, and, and we have a special permit for that. If I can address that, the reason I made my comment ahead of time was it was a good opportunity to bring it up. It wasn't meant to reflect on this project, which is why I said it that way. So it was not meant to, to do it, but that's why I made the comment ahead of time that it was a good opportunity as we look at planning, because we also have the planning aspect ahead of time. So it was not meant to reflect on okay. this use. And just one other final comment. The chief did say, you know, he has concerns about facilities that are coming in. And that's not the case in, in, with respect to Golden Pond. Golden Pond's here and received approvals, approvals uh, what, now uh, eight years ago. So we are not in that class of facilities coming, new facilities that are coming in. Um, you know, we're existing, and, and you're probably going to hear that um, from Joe and, and, and myself throughout this um, uh, commentary, for example, on landscaping and on lighting and all that, that these issues have been approved by the town already. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would um, like to jump in there and just um, offer uh, a, a diversion opinion on that and I think mm -hmm. the capacity issues are definitely something that this board must address and I respectfully um, acknowledge that the permits happened in 2009 um, there's no way to fully address capacity issues for a future project in 2017 at the permitting time in 2009 um, and respectfully we simply have to contemplate particularly the fire chief's input on capacity. Right. So uh, just res respond, it's not within your jurisdiction. You may want to do that. You may think it's proper, but it's not within your jurisdiction to regular use. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. So that being said, I will open it up to the public for any additional comments or areas that need to be added to the um, site plan review. Right. Seeing none. Jennifer? Is the board adding anything to the outline? I don't think we are. Anything for the board members? No. Right. It's solid. It's rock solid. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
so we, then if you do, you want to continue to the next, is that what you're saying? I, that's what I want to make sure if we do it on the August 14th, 14th we have um, time on the agenda. How much time do you want to give Chamberlain over? An hour and more or uh, an hour? I would say next uh, on the 14th, I would say an hour, at least an hour, maybe an hour and a well, half. Well, I think, I think if, an hour, though, because we may. Well, if I can, It may go quicker. It, might, it may go quicker. If we if we determine that based on what was provided, we can make a decision, it'll go relatively fast. If we decide we want to go through the whole agenda, and then make take the vote on the open space, then we need the full hour. There's a definite maybe. So, but I, but maybe. but also. Um, I think I, I would echo an hour mm -hmm. because if we have to continue it, we they will probably stay and finish up if we don't have other business after this. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I just that it's kind of the best of both possible worlds. We'd, we'd have more time on the agenda that we haven't necessarily we put it. set aside. I, 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 one comment I would make for this meeting: you know, that half hour went pretty quick, so we should give an hour at least. Yes, yes, yes. 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 I, I would agree with that. Stating the obvious, I guess. No, so. but that's awesome. You know, what else do we have have on that? So why don't we, if it's seven thirty to eight thirty, why don't we go eight thirty to nine forty-five? So give an hour and fifteen minutes. If we finish earlier. Maybe like but 15 minutes for miscellaneous business from 9:45 to 10. 8:35, so you can have a five-minute break. Yes, 8:35 to 9:45. So August 14th at 8:35. Are you talking about continuing this hearing? Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. um, you're not available. Yeah, I have an issue with the 14th. Oh, we're not available on August. Okay. okay. Uh -huh. Good to know. Next open date. What else have you got? It's like a month <laughs> later, I think. Well, so we never decided whether or not we were going to meet August 28th. What do we have Nothing. coming up? Um, in, in, in the pipeline, we have this and we have a site plan for 52 Wilson Street that I haven't scheduled yet. That's the 28th. Do right? those two on the 28th. Anybody not going to be here the 28th? That's okay for me. Okay. I'm hoping I'm not here. Phil, Phil, you're not. The best, but <laughs> something else. Phil's not here. Phil's not here. August 28th, right? Well, we have. Okay. So okay. the on. So why don't we say August 28th at. Does that work for you? 730. 730. August 28th? Yes. Um, but can I ask, um, given the, the scope of this project, a half hour seems limited to. No, we no, didn't no, have no, an no, no. hour and 15 hour minutes. Time. No. Yeah, we, we just had that, just said that it was too quick. Hour and, right. hour hour and no, no. 10 minutes. Well, that's yes. what we were talking about. Well, so 7 30. So 7 30, we'd go to 8 45. Does that work for you guys? 7 30. That's about how many questions you've had. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But the we'll day we'll do our best to fill the time. 7 30 to 8 45. Right. Yeah. Okay, on the 28th. Well, 7.30 till whenever. I mean, if you finish before 8.45, right. yeah. <laughs> stick around. <laughs> well, you need to know that for scheduling, though. No. No, no. Okay. okay. Are we continuing tonight? Yeah. This not you know, because you're we, done. We have to move yeah, on yeah. to that. I, I make a motion to move this meeting. Continue this hearing. Public hearing on the 28th of uh, August at 7.30 p.m. Yes, that is my motion. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed, abstain. It carries. See you guys on the 28th of August. Thank you. Thank you. Start getting going here. Yeah. <laughs> Just warming up. Next item is we had already voted to open the meeting and to um, adjourn it until after this was open. So let's uh, continue with uh, public hearing on Zero Ash Street. 
and the man of the moment, our tree warden, if you could come up and um, I think that was the first question uh, that had had popped up. So why don't you discuss uh, what you saw and then what has uh, developed since the last um, additional information that is available. Okay, can I take a moment first to just go over something that takes yes. about 30 seconds? Um, I'm a graduate of the Stockbridge School of Agriculture with a degree in arboriculture. I became a Massachusetts certified arborist in 1973. Since then, I've also become a International Society of Arboriculture certified arborist. I've licensed in Maine and Rhode Island. I am a Massachusetts certified landscape professional and I hold a commercial applicator's license in pesticide application for uh, tree and shrubs. In order to maintain all of those credentials, I have to take continuing education units. So those are my qualifications and I have to keep up to date with those. That being said, the tree that we're discussing has a saprot fungus called Serena unicolor. It has already invaded the sapwood of the, the tree, which is underneath the bark. The pictures that you should have in your packet show the white fruiting bodies of the fungus. Those spew literally millions of spores into the air where they wait for the next, uh, the next victim, I should say. If I may read a letter from Dr. Um, Nicholas Brezzi, that be appropriate? Yes. Okay. I sent him photos that you have. We should also have a copy of his letter. And he says, it looks like Serena Unicolor, a weak saprot pathogen that attacks a wide array of hardwoods in the area. It's not aggressive. It can only attack severely weakened trees. It's usually a sure sign that death is near. Most saprot fungi invade trees near death, get what they can in terms of sugars that produce a large number of fruiting bodies. If the oak is still alive, it probably won't be for very much longer. That is from Nicholas Brzee, plant pathologist, UMass Extension Service, PhD. So that is where we stand. We have a dying oak tree at zero tree. So I think, uh to put it in my layman's terms, which may have been, I think we, at the, the prior hearing when you weren't here, I think there might have been a perception that the fungus was killing the tree, but in effect, the tree was dying and the fungus was able to grow because the tree was already in such a bad state. That's correct. Okay. Questions from? board so what's the how long has the tree got left I would estimate it three to five years tops but don't take that to the bank um, where it's already rotted as badly as it is um, if you stand behind the tree for example the fruiting bodies of the fungus are already up to eye level so you're looking at you know, a solid five feet oh, yes. and a column that comes down and begins to wrap around the front of the tree. A good thunderstorm, tropical depression, heavy wet snow, you name it, all bets are off. Okay. That's good so does this fungus exacerbate the dying of the tree? Does it? Yeah, it's basically stealing the tree's food supply. Okay. That's where the, uh, Dr. Brazy says it's, uh, they get what they can in terms of sugars, which is the stored food, mm -hmm. and then they produce, you know, they, they go through their sexual reproduction period and produce the spores. Is it treatable? Not at this point in time, no. So just, any just for the folks at home, if we can repeat that question, because people. Well, that's what I want to get. If somebody has a comment from the audience, if you can get up, come up to the microphone and identify yourself, so the people at home can hear you. So, Mr. Chair, 
just a clarification here to summarize where we are with this particular project. This is a project that the town is looking to put a small parking lot and a driveway in. And this tree is just a small piece of correct. Okay, yeah. correct. But as a reminder, this is a scenic road public hearing for the removal of two trees and a portion of the stone wall right. only. Right. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, if I might back up to what you had yes. pointed out. The question being that this, uh, was this, is this treatable? No, it's not because the tree was already in a weakened state that allowed the invasion of this sap rock fungus. So you would have had to have been trying to maintain this tree long before it reached this state, which being a roadside tree in the woods just doesn't get that kind of attention. It's not like it's in the middle of somebody's lawn. Mr. Chair, just a question on the clarification from our planner. Can you just elaborate a little more? This is a meeting. So the application before you is a scenic road application yes. for the removal of two trees and a portion of the stone wall. So nothing beyond that. Right. There's no site plan before you. There's no anything else. It's strictly for the discussion of the removal of two trees and a portion of the stone wall. So why would we approve that? If why would we approve just removing a wall if there's nothing else to talk about? Well, it's, they're, they're giving you the reason why they're removing the stone wall and the two trees, but you're not reviewing okay. anything other than that. Okay. And why don't you talk about the next step, which is the um, board of selectmen? So because initially we received, um, to, to my knowledge, at least three Op, uh, letters in opposition to the removal of one of the trees um, <coughs> under, I believe it's Mass General Law, Chapter 87, um, is that right? The public right. Shade Tree Law. Um, normally, we would hold a hearing in conjunction with the tree warden to remove the trees because he's required to hold that hearing as well. But because we received a minimum of, I think it's three letters in opposition prior to the hearing, that, that aspect of it now goes before the Board of Selectmen. So we can approve the the tree removal under the scenic road bylaw, but the board of selectmen <laughs> will have to hold a hearing to remove the trees under the public shade tree law. So through you, Mr. Chair, I'm still a little confused. So if this is a two-step process, and step one gets approved, and we remove a tree and a stone wall, and step two gets rejected, what we accomplished? The tree won't go anywhere, if I understand yeah. it correctly, until, <laughs> yeah. the, until correct. the selectmen have correct. their That's hearing. Correct. So while it's a two-step process, it's not one and step here, the tree goes, and then there's no it's point. It's yeah. only a two-step process because we received objections. Right. Okay. The and, and just to clarify or piggyback on that, if the does the decision by the Board of Selectmen overrule anything that we... Yeah, if, the select, if you vote. say yes, the trees can be removed, and the selectmen say no, the trees cannot be removed. Perfect. So, yes. So, identify yourself, name, and address, please. No. <laughs> <laughs> Joe Regan, 37 Front Street, Philip Town Meeting. As one who had the job seven years previous to Paul, and between the two of us, we have about 100 years experience in the field. He has 85 of those. I only have 15, of course, <laughs> because of my young age. Um, when you see a tree like that, you ask, is a tree going to live? Will it die at some point? But more than likely, the weight is all left-sided. That fruiting body indicates that wood is rotting underneath. When you lose the rot, you lose it. When you lose the wood, you lose the support. That's the same as you taking a chainsaw and cutting it in the backside. Sooner or later, it's gonna go. So if you're lucky, it'll die. Then you'll know what you have on your hands. Um, it's, it's a hazard, definitely, and Paul would explain under chapter 87, you're, you're in a sticky situation here because he has the authority to say that tree is a hazard. Neither posting nor hearing is required according to 87. Neither one of us are here talking about the parking area, talking about the, the, uh, right. the tree itself. So I'm here to support Paul, but he's absolutely right in everything he said. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think you just answered one of my questions I was going to ask. One is, uh, is the tree unstable? Will it eventually come down on its own if we don't take it down? Yeah, at, at some point, it will have to come down. Right. Um, and then. Two, do, is this spreadable? Can this, will this uh, affect other trees in the area? It will area? affect other trees of many species, provided they are as weak as this host tree is now. So, of course, remember last year we had 
probably one of the worst droughts in recent history, and gypsy moths. So that we've got a lot of trees that are um, in jeopardy. You know, to, to something like this, something that normally wouldn't be able to bother them until they become in a weakened condition. Well, I, I just speaking for myself, um, I appreciate you taking the time to be here to answer our questions because I don't, I know that I didn't feel like I had as much information, um, and I do know that. Um, I also sort of complicated the hearing in my own mind, uh, contemplating the additional work that's going going on, but we really appreciate the specifics on the tree because we just didn't really feel last time that we understood um, the, stat the true status of the tree. And it wasn't really, um, it wasn't really challenging your in input, it's just that we had further questions. So I appreciate you taking the time to to help us with that. Um, I, I'm prepared to make a motion, I don't know. Well, you, just, oh. you had asked conservation to be here as oh. well. Yes, so. conservation. Thank, yeah. you. Thank you. He's been waiting so this whole have, time. <laughs> Come forward. Come forward. Well, we have it. That's not conservation. I know. Hi, uh, Jay Crochet, 153 Ash Street. Yes. And um, I have a question, if I could just uh, back up a step. So. Uh, I abut the proposed parking lot directly, as do several of the other neighbors who are here, uh, and I'm in, in opposition to it for a myriad of reasons. So I guess my question is, is it a foregone conclusion that if this um, hearing passes tonight and the selectmen say, yes, the tree can come down, the stone wall can be removed, that this parking lot is going in? Or is that still up for debate? Because at the last hearing, I think there were some other potential sites for a parking lot that objectively and subjectively may be better suited for it. So that's my question to the, to the board. If, if I can address that, we do have a submission that we will discuss on the alternatives that we'll look at. So we will be covering that before and to answer those questions there's, a, there's another question in there if I'm and that I, I share what is the process I know the feedback that we have but what is the process for people who are so for a parking lot of four spaces there is no additional approvals needed needed other than a driveway curb cut through the DPW and because it's a scenic road this process right here so if the trees and the stone wall removal gets approved then if they have the funding they can build the parking lot And if I could, just to follow up on that, so they could build it without any other, they don't need to consider other sites, is that what I'm hearing? Um, no. Yeah. Um, they did, they did, and that's the document that he's gonna, we're gonna talk about that he's referring to. They did consider other sites, but they're not required to. Even if it's cost-effective? It's, it's their land, they can. Thanks. I'm just going to ask to remind people to come up because nobody can hear at home what the questions are, and that's the, the process is coming to the mic and identifying yourself. The question that was asked from the audience is uh, even if it's cost effective. So, before the question, is there a representative from the town? I know Elaine last time was representative. So, Elaine the town. is unavailable. Uh, she had a death in the family, so she is not available tonight. Um, I know that um, Phil was representing as the engineer on the project, so he won't be able to speak to some of it. And um, I believe CONCOM is here as, as part of that process as well. So I just what, what I heard even from Jay is um, what about the other um, potential options? Has the town re-reviewed them, or have they? Well, I think that's what we're going to discuss. Okay, I just want to make sure right. that that's going to happen, and it's yeah. just not going to be tree going away. Because it concentrated on the tree first, then we'll. Point of order, yeah. not really point of order, but a question. Is it possible we can take a vote that we agree that the tree can be taken down if, if necessary? Because it seems like, we have that, like you said, we have that discussion now. But we well, I think it's be, one vote, so let's just take. Huh? Okay, including okay. the rock wall and everything. Yeah. Okay. Because where is the representative from the town? I heard Joe yeah. was here. Or? Oh, Jeff. Jeff Barnes, I'm the chair of the Conservation Commission. 
Um, so the applicant for this particular uh, parking lot location is the town and the Conservation Commission is the custodian for Elmwood Farm. So uh, we were charged with uh, looking at some of the other options for parking so that the public can access Elmwood Farm and you have that analysis in your packet. Um, and there are copies out on the table. Mm -hmm. if you can. So there were two obvious access points um, this was one of them because it's town owned property so that's at zero ash street uh, there's another location which is further up ash street which is uh, identified as option d in your packet that's the strip of land owned by the town between 97 and 101 ash street that is currently being utilized by the town and is uh, capable of accommodating two cars at that particular location. Bless you. So this option D and the location that we're currently contemplating where the uh, tree is located, um, as I said, were the two obvious choices. Um, so when the, uh, when the parking lot um, at this location was reviewed, the, uh, there was actually a proposal to, I think it was uh, six parking locations. Um, the driveway um, ingress to the parking lot <coughs> was uh, a little bit wider than what's currently proposed. And what we did was, is we actually, um, to be respectful of the neighbors at this location, we required the parking lot to be uh, reduced in size to four parking lot or parking space, parking spaces, excuse me, and to uh, uh, minimize the access width so that less trees would be disturbed, less of the stone wall would be disturbed, uh, and less property um, would be disturbed getting access into it. So, uh, sorry, quick interruption just for clarity improvement in yep. the future. On the map, okay. what? Which, is this D, E, F, or G that we're talking about? Which one? So on? D. D. Well, D well, is the location yeah, that's currently. Um, there's two spaces. Oh. Right. So that's up in the area where the brick farmhouse is. Okay. That was renovated. Mm -hmm. um, the zero Ash Street location is between. Uh, it's marked F on our map. Oh, it's, it's marked not F on the map. It's not marked. No. Yeah, it's not marked. It's, it's not marked, right. Oh, but it's between, between F and G. G. It's between okay. F and G. Okay, thank Correct. you. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, please continue. Okay. So as you go through the packet, you'll see some of the other options that we looked at. Um, there's land owned by the town, which is option A, under the jurisdiction of the water department off Ash Street. Uh, that would require access through a current subdivision um, and it would also require a 238 foot long uh, access road between existing properties. So again, you run into a similar situation where you're going between private property, um, but there's even more disturbance uh, in this option A um, scenario. Option B, land owned by the town under the jurisdiction of the water department off Ash Street. Um, item B, uh, we looked at that, um, but given the deed restrictions on that particular area, that wasn't a viable option because it couldn't be used as trailhead parking. C is land owned by the town off Aprila Farm Road. Mm -hmm. um, we looked at that area as well. Um, there is access potentially um, through uh, the existing wellhead um, area for the uh, town water supply. Uh, however, and there was potentially the possibility to have a few vehicles that could park there, um, but it just was impractical given the amount of area that was going to potentially be disturbed. It goes through a cranberry bog. Um, so, you know, in the final analysis, it, it really wasn't a practical option either. Um, just item uh, D, we just talked about that. That's where there's the two uh, existing parking spaces. 
Uh, item E was 117 Ash Street. Uh, there is a potential uh, easement there that the town has that's currently being reviewed um, by town council and we haven't gotten any final indication for them on whether that's a viable, viable option. So that's uh, currently being looked at and that could be a possibility. There's the Eversource land, option F. Um, again, this was uh, it's town um, that Eversource has the easement on. And um, just trying to remember what the Eversource doesn't own the land. Eversource yeah, does not own the land, that is correct. Uh, so the actual owners of 143 and 145 Ash Street would have to grant the town an easement to access that particular location. And then there's land owned option G, land owned at um, 157 or 159 Ash Street, which is the arena family. Um, again, that's, uh, I believe the arenas have told the town that they are amenable to having people you know, park in their parking lot um, and walk up to the property um, to get access. But again, that requires uh, someone to walk along Ash Street for a couple hundred feet um, along a narrow road. So from a public safety standpoint, it's not an ideal situation. Um, and it's not a permanent solution. If the arenas ended up selling the property, um, you know, that access could potentially be um, with new property owners taken away. Um, so it's just, you know, it's a temporary solution, but it's not a, a, a permanent solution. And again, if, uh, uh, you know, either the arenas or a new property owner would have to grant the town um, access in order to have a permanent um, solution uh, at that location. So that was the alternatives analysis we looked at. Again, um, it doesn't look like uh, any of those other than the, um, the option that the town is, uh, the town council is currently reviewing, looks to be viable. Um, so again, it gets us back to the Zero Ash Street location, which we thought uh, was the most practical solution. Um, and uh, I'll open it up to any questions. I don't know, Phil, if you had anything to add. So Zero is the one that's not shown on the map? Right. Correct. That's getting a little you. section between those. That must be right here. A little jog. So, yeah, it's like a little between F and G. I did have a question. If it's, it's all right. Um, so, I was expecting originally when I heard about this that it would be at the location where the trailhead sign is, which is marked D, and there, I guess, there are two spots there now. Is it, do we, we, so we need more than two spots? Is that the, the problem? Correct. Okay. Yeah, so, the town. You know, spend a considerable amount of money purchasing this property. So, you know, we feel we have a responsibility to provide the public access um, or reasonable access to it. And just at the, you know, at the current location that people are using, there's only two lo uh, parking lo uh, spots at that location. So it's just, um, you know, we feel it's inadequate. I believe this, isn't there also an issue with um the DPW found a manhole or something at that location and they can't access it very easily anymore or something driving onto that property right there. I thought mm. it was something mentioned I last think there's time. something similar. That's why there's only two spaces. They had more, but then they had 10 spaces, and that's why there's only two spaces. Question to you, Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, is there any kind of trails like where where are people trying to get to is there a certain trail that in the in the property the uh, the access that most people are using is up um, where the two parking spaces are located because that provides a pathway you know past the old farmhouse out into the um, lodge area out back but so in that property itself is there like a, a loop trail or any any predefined trails or I think there's a marked trail. Yeah, there, there are yeah. trails on the property, yes. Okay. And they could get to that easily from this location that you're suggesting? It would provide access um, to the larger parcel. Um, 
I think there would have to be a trail. Um, Small connector put, trail. Put, yeah, put in place and marked so that people can access the greater you know, trail network that's on the property. I don't think there's actually a trail that goes down to that location. Is there? Right, up the street there. Yes, yeah. there is. Yeah. It's not at this. Correct. Okay, thanks. And I just have a question related to G. Um, so you mentioned that it, would, it wouldn't really be a permanent solution, but couldn't the town get an easement for that property and that would apply to the house being sold? Maybe it's not your expertise and not mine either, but I would think that. So which one, pro which also, property? Arena. 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 So if the town had an easement, a legal easement, yeah, they, that, that, I mean, would be, they, that would be a permit solution, right? Right. Okay. And you said mentioned they'd have to walk on Ash Street. So it's not that far. Well, why no can't street. they just go through the back of the property or no? Because it's all privately owned. This okay, that, that one section. So to get to the town-owned parcel, they have to walk a couple hundred feet okay. up Ash Street to get to the town to where, property. To the section we're proposing, you're proposing right now. Correct. Let's call it H. Yeah. Or they could walk further up to the existing right, right. Okay, uh, thank you. parking lot. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. You're welcome. Any other comments from? Hi, um, I'm Kevin Van Beek. I live at 149 Ash Street. And uh, you know, just looking at other options, uh, is it illegal to park on Ash Street and, and enter the property through the right of way at the brick house? I mean, is that an option? To you, Mr. Chair? Yo. I, I don't yeah. know whether it's legal or not, but I don't think it would be safe. Well, I mean, you're putting a parking lot in a dangerous corner further down. That that's still off the street, and not somebody driving along is going to smash into a parked car. Have you ever? That's a little different. That's have just you my looked opinion. at the area? You no, know, but I, I know Ash Street. Street. I don't know that specific area, but I know Ash Street. It is. A, it's a marked 15 mile per hour area, and I've never seen a car go 15 mile per hour down that road. And it's on a curve. And it's on a dangerous curve. Um, I, mean, I hate to be the devil's yeah. advocate, but I wouldn't want people parking on Ash Street, in my opinion. If I can, before we get down, one of the issues that we have is we have limited jurisdiction on what we're reviewing. So, but um, isn't that a viable option to park on Ash? But the the basically, it's not our ability as one town board to tell another town town board. To do something different from what they proposed. But, so, but, so, uh, but it, under the scenic law, you're supposed to look at other viable options. Correct. That is an option, correct? Correct. But I think we're in a yeah. little tricky situation here, so just understand that. But it is an option to, to the board, to the park right. on Ash Street, to access that property. Yeah, there's nothing that I says people that. Can't, yeah. can't park on yeah. Ash Street. Right. Right. It's an option. I mean, they can also park on Blue Barrier Stone Crossing. Too. Correct. Right. And then the other question is, the right of way up at the brick house that the town owns, why couldn't a small driveway be put in to further access the back property? You know, I've walked that uh, act, that access road. It's not perfect, but but you don't have to remove a stone wall. You don't have to remove a tree. There's a, a beautiful pond in the back that. Uh, you know, as if people are walking these trails, uh, the fire department would have access to the pond if there were ever a fire. With the increased traffic of people out there, the potential for fire is, is greater. You know, it's just an added benefit. But I, don't, I didn't hear why we couldn't put a, a gravel road to that back pond. It's, you know, the, the minimum, the, looking at the map and stuff and looking at it, uh, the, the narrowest spot is 15 feet. The, you, down below you, your narrow spot, you're talking about putting a driveway in of 15 feet, I believe. You know, I don't see why they couldn't put an access road up above. So what, for those in following, I think it's difficult to follow, is I think we're all on the same. If you can provide some D. reference points. It's a D. D. So it would be the, 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 the right of way, the 15 Option D. D, right? D, I yeah. believe, yes. So, which is the existing. Yes. So, 
existing, he is the two, existing two space access. manhole. Right. And, and again, part of the scenic law is to determine if there's other alternatives. Right. You know, what is the issue with putting an access road there? The railway is 15 feet wide and takes two right hand corners. There but at the right hand corners, it goes to about 25 feet, I would say. No, not our right away, does it? If you look at the. Mm -hmm. As it swings the corner, it's right 50 feet left. here, as it swings the corner, it's about 25 feet. Oh, it's 15 feet wide. It's 15, yeah, but as on the corner, it's wider. We need a radius. We need a radius to turn the And it's and, and about 20, I would say about 20, 20 to 25 feet at that, at that corner. No, the, radius, the biggest radius you can have is 15 feet. I'd have to look at it closer, but I, you know, looking at it on the map, I would guess it would be 20 to 25 feet on the on the corner. You know what I mean? <laughs> but 15 feet, you couldn't turn at 15 feet. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, uh, question: Is there or has the conservation committee or the town looked at option D to modify that road, or are we just constrained by the the? By the width of the existing the abutters, kind of what I thought, but I thought I'd give it a shot. <laughs> Come up to the microphone. Hi, Ed Harrell, Spring Lane certified tree lover, as both Joe and Paul can attest. And I, I am on the Conservation Commission, but I am not speaking on behalf of the Conservation Commission. I'm on open space, and I'm not speaking on behalf of open space. I'm speaking purely of my own volition. Um, when this came up before the, the Conservation Commission, I took it upon myself to go down and look at this. And I do not have the credentials, but I did do tree work for two years for both town and private citizen or private companies, and I looked up at the tree and I saw some dieback at the top of the tree, so I knew the tree probably had some issues. But that was not the thing that really sort of got to me. What got to me was one house lot and a big parking area. And I went down and I talked to Joanne, and unfortunately, and I apologize again for not checking with Paul, but that's what I was told. She said the tree warden. Um, someone from the town before me talked to her. I mean, this is a curious thing. Um, and I would just like to find a better way to do this. I understand the tree has some issues. I understand it's going to fall down someday. But I feel like I need Joni Mitchell. You find paradise and you put up a parking lot and a big yellow taxi. Anybody remember that song? I could sing it, but you don't want me to. You can. Hey, I'll join with you. <laughs> so I've said my piece. Um, in the 30 plus years we've lived here, all I see is trees going down. They get cut down here, they get cut down there, they get cut down some other place for trivial reasons in some cases. We get trees that get cut down that are inside buffer zones because somebody wants to build a cabana. Um, so I'm doing a rear guard action. I know it's a rear guard action. I know rear guard actions always lose. I'm going to do it anyway. Thank you. Hi, Cynthia Gebler, Ash Street. Um, Your address. I have actually. Which Your, number? What oh, number? Oh, um, 160. Okay. <laughs> um, I actually have gone up the street and pulled my car in there, my husband and I. And, and Which turn, location? Go up at by the D. At D. D, whatever it is. The two spaces. Right, the two spaces. And I'm just wondering, um, I understood that we owned quite a bit of property back there. We hiked back down there. We pulled our car in. It was quite easy, pulled in. Um, you don't have to tear down trees. You don't have to do anything. It's already there. But I understood that there was property back there that they could use to build a parking lot. Was that correct? To put a parking lot up that area? Is, it was just debating the fact that we only had 15 feet to get there. That was correct, right? We looked at uh, several options for access in this location because the other access is not suitable for Right. 
so do you, do you understand what I'm asking? I thought that there was a place where even though you have 15 feet that you could pull in and still go further back and build a parking lot, that we owned that property, the town owned that property. We don't um, own the street, though. Yes, yes. We, I don't believe we owned the street in that section, though. We only have a 15-foot easement at the street level that goes back a certain number of feet to our property. Right. So we only have access rights across that 15 feet, and it has several turns. And so I did. I went that right. You go so right. You go in, you turn right, and then you turn left. Right. And so what the engineers are saying is that it's not safe for cars to make that turning radius back there. I believe that's what you're saying, right? Hmm. Yeah, when you get one, one car back there, you can't get one. Okay, okay. I guess I, if you were to look at the, if you're talking about safety issue, I think that's more safe than pulling out on the curve of where it is. But that's beside the point. That's beside, I mean, I just think that you should really look at, it just seems like there's, you could put a parking lot back. I mean, sure, one person would have to back out to the parking lot and the other person come in. I mean, you know, there's just, it's not, I mean, we do that all the time. But anyway, you were talking about, okay, it only has two parking spaces. I've gone to several of the trails throughout the town, and we have no parking all these other towns. I went to North, North Mill. That has no parking whatsoever. So if you look at all the trails that we have in town, we have very little parking. I suggest that we connect all of these trails together instead of making huge parking lots with these things, connect all the trails together so that you can use trails throughout all of the town rather than making it disjointed. Here's a parking lot here, here's a parking lot here. But looking at the trails that we do have, there's very few that have parking lots. I've been through almost all of them. There's one off the pond, there's one off of North Mill. There's no parking at all. I mean, how a person is supposed to get to hike on the one on North Mill? There is no parking, and that's a really narrow, narrow part there. So why are we talking about, you know, we're talking about this putting parking lot here. Why are we doing this when we have all these trails throughout the whole town? I did talk to Joanne. She mentioned, she said, you can do whatever you want. Put a sign up. It's not that far from Joanne's part to, to walking in right there. I mean, if we're talking about cost and taxes of what's going to pay, cost for our t the residents to pay for things like this, um, can grandfather something in so that whoever buys her property understand that, says the town owns this until as a parking lot, whatever. Yeah, I think the issue with that is the, the property owner would have to grant an easement. Right. We don't have the ability that. to go right. in and right. grab an easement. I understand that, right. So but without having Joanne here to make that right. statement. I understand that. But I'm just saying, I think there's other options that we should, right. we're talking about. And I understand you don't have the final say in it either. Right. But thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to address to your chair one point she was making. I think this is, I would actually commend the town from, for trying to create a parking lot for a trail. So I think the plan is that they'd probably do additional ones so that people could have access to trails. So this sounds like the first one, of, I would guess, of many. But thank you for the input. Pam Waxlax, 15 Smith Road, Walker on Ash Street on weekends with the dog and I wouldn't want to walk up at I do walk up Ash Street but only on weekends and it's dangerous but I did want to point out part of the reason that this is before you all is part of the purchase of this farm back in 2012 got $400,000 of state grant money and part of that grant was a requirement to provide public parking with Elmwood Farm so that's why it's in front of you you can't park, I mean, you, it doesn't qualify like, oh, we can park on the street. It was definitely required to build a parking lot with this. There was no requirement, according to Dave Del Torrio back in 2015 when he spoke to Appropriation Committee about the number of spaces required. So that's some wiggle room. But I just wanted to give you a little bit of information as to why. Where is Smith on the 
Smith here. Yeah, I'm just trying to orient. Where it's off of Chestnut Street. We go off campus. It's not, it's not, yeah, it's, it's not anywhere close to here. I, okay. I just I walk Ash that. on weekends. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> Can someone tell me what's uh, below Carriage Hill? Stone Crossing. Thank you. Because it looks like that access. Anybody uh, else in the audience have comments? Can I ask the con con? Yeah. Oh, thank you. I couldn't find you. Um, uh, it, it, does it look like there are trails that come off a stone crossing into that parcel? Yes, they do. I believe there are, yes. I have a question for the tree warden. Is, is the tree... Um, is it a public safety issue? Yes. Uh, is it a is, is it a danger? Yes. Because I, I I mean I know nobody in this room would want to take down a healthy tree, so I guess I'm struggling with. I understand this is a it's a big tree. It's on a scenic road. I certainly understand everybody's concern about removing a tree. I, I share the same concern, but I'm struggling with knowing that this could potentially fall down and you know kill somebody if they're driving by I, I guess that's what I want to know is is like what level of danger are we talking about with this tree um, nobody can give you an accurate assessment of that yeah uh, like I said earlier you know a thunderstorm could brew up tomorrow and all speculation goes out the window right so what I will tell you is that under the Shade Tree Act, Chapter um, it's, uh, Chapter 87, Section 5, once I come to the point where I believe that the tree is a hazard to the public, I have the right and the duty to remove it without benefit of hearing. I just take it down. Seems seems that's brought up. How how is that right exercise? Because I, I have to tell you, I've been looking. <laughs> I've been looking at dead trees in the roadway with a new with a new appreciation. How how like how does the um, I live all the way down 135, so there's a there's a lot of um, in it looks like in the public way. So just how does the process work for tree management from your perspective? And I know that it doesn't necessarily apply to this tree in this scenic road hearing, but scenes we're talking about it. How does that process work from your perspective for the town? Uh, I've got to either find it myself or be brought to my attention. Uh, I have a limited amount of money to work with, so um, I have to prioritize what I think are the worst of the worst. And uh, I do have contacts with the Eversource uh, since their wires are strung all over town. And uh, as many trees as I can get Eversource to remove, I do. So if uh, you know, even in the case of this particular tree that we are discussing, if it were to fall towards the street, it would take every source of wires. Uh, I'm going to approach them and see if they'll spend their buck and not mine. So, Mr. Chairman, I have a question back, I guess, for the town and, and conservation. Option D, is there any wiggle room at all in there? Any options? Because I look at this and I say, walking up, Ash Street from the arena property, looking at the proposed uh, four parking spots. I know that bend. I know how people drive going up and down. Um, and it's just, it's going to be a tough, it's a tough go. The one that I keep coming back to is somehow on D. If there's anything that could be done, it seems like that has the most potential. I think the town doesn't own that property, though. They have right. access. And right. right, there's an access in there, and, I'm, and maybe you go to the abutter and say, you know what, could we somehow have access to I, mean, I, I don't know. I'm trying to, maybe I'm looking at uh, barking up a tree here because I don't like any of the other options. Like Period. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, some of these um, access points that are on private property, you can't get, I mean, you can't approach the private property on ask them for access to the property. You know, ask them if they'll grant the construction of a road as part of that access. Um, you know, it's just, it's just 
it's not town owned property. So that's you know another process that the town has to go through. Um, and you know, I just uh, you know, I have a tough time uh, thinking that someone who owns private property is gonna grant it yeah, Absolutely, so right? So for, 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 yeah. Right. Who don't want a parking lot. I, I get it, yeah. right? It's, uh, right? And I would just, I would just add to that 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 property also has an agricultural restriction on it, so we'd have to review the restriction to make sure that parking is even allowed within the restriction itself. Tire tracks on. That's the D. Property. That's D. Yeah. So it already so exists. So uh, 97 Ash, I believe it is, has an actual agri agricultural restriction on the entire property. But it already has spaces. Within our easement, I believe our yeah. easement is exempted. Oh, so you're thinking about additional spaces? Well, I think that's what somebody mentioned. Right. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. One. So there's an easement to our yeah. property. Yeah. The spaces are within the easement, which is permitted. Mm -hmm. but once you hit the property, where additional parking would be. I'm not saying that it's not, not permitted, be, but I'm saying we have to review the restriction to confirm. So a procedural, and I'm just going. I'm not speaking as chair, but just throwing, trying to take people's concerns. I think it's hard, and I'll speak for me, to make the argument that the trees stand in the way because I think this tree is coming down at some point. I think we now go to the, to the wall, and part of it is we don't have the authority over the whole thing, so that's kind of the odd position. So we have done similar approvals for stone walls before, so we talk about precedence. So the next step would be granting the authority based on that, what the alternatives are. So if we're talking about alternatives, what ability do we have if, if and I'm not saying where I stand one way or the other, I'm just trying to figure out how to get someplace. If we feel that there are other alternatives that should be explored, do we have the right to, I guess we have the right to adjourn the meeting and postpone it to a future time and ask to come back and explore, or do we actually have the ability to turn down if we feel the alternatives were not fully explored. So one of your criteria that you have to find is that there are availability of reasonable alternatives to the proposed work which could reduce or eliminate eliminate anticipated damage to trees or stone walls. Okay. So if you find that there isn't the availability of reasonable alternatives or you have they haven't explored the availability right. of reasonable alternatives, then you could deny it. Okay. Can I have a informal <laughs> discussion on from the board members just so have we, haven't we already Sorry. explored the alternatives well we've gone through we've explored the alternatives if you make the determination that all the alternatives were not explored fully I'm looking at Jennifer well, I, would, I would say that you make the determination that reasonable alternatives were not proposed okay. Mr. Chairman okay. if I could just uh, yes we still have option E is open, the uh, access that town council's reviewing at 117 Ash Street. There are materials, I thought it said that. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that it's doesn't already, look like town owned property, though, I would yeah, think. So it's well, that you found no evidence that an easement in favor of the town exists or has ever existed, unless you're looking at something different. So, I think. So, under option E. Yeah. The review found no evidence that an easement in favor of the town exists or has ever existed across 117 Ash. Town Council has noted that there are two access points to Ash Street from the town's parcel between 97 and 101, not wide enough for vehicle, vehicular access. That must be the existing one. Is that right? Yes. And 149 and 153. So, Mr. Chair, to your point about easements, I would like to go on record that I feel they have explored the ball valid alternatives okay. and I don't see a valid one. I mean we just spent a lot of time here talking about this and I think an easement for the town is a big headache. It seems like to me it's the only valid town owned entry 
point to this property? I'd have to say based on the can, information can I have, can? I would agree with that statement. Okay, so um, I, I want to be careful to say I, I appreciate the level of work that went into exploring options because I think a lot of work went into it. Um, I, I would still want to see if we could add a couple additional spaces um, or just use stone crossing and access it there and it wouldn't, it wouldn't require taking down more trees or um, even creating a parking lot because stone crossing is a quiet road. Um, so th that's just an alternative that we see tonight that hasn't been explored. Um, I did drive down there and I did sit across from the tree um, and I'm not arguing um, the health of the tree with you, sir. Um, but I wouldn't let my son get out of the car to take a picture of it. Um, and I went down a second time and from the other direction, and not only would I not let him out of the car while I took a picture of it again, he's a little tired of this trip down that tree, by the way. Um, I felt exposed sitting in a car, sitting at that spot. Um, it's, I know our jurisdiction is only that tree, um, but it's gonna take the whole hill and the trees behind it. Um, and from a practical stand, I'm very sympathetic to the homeowners on each side. If it was me, I would be very opposed to this idea um, because they're, they're right on top of, I understand they don't own this little strip of property, but they are right on top of it. And it impacts their homes more than um, the other alternatives. Um, did we, so I have, I have two questions. Can we explore Stone Crossing? And did we approach um, the new property owners of the Eversource for an easement possibility? Because I've also, that's like a runway into the property with shielding on both sides. I know that they own the property within, but it does shield their homes. I don't know if that's anybody does. When, when you're referring to Stone Crossing, no, which one is that? it's not on here as an, as a, it's Stone Crossing is, this little cul-de-sac that comes down here the below the carriage. Oh. Right. So again, you'd have to ask for an easement? No, I, it looks like there's access to the property. From where? A lot. In the if he's, it probably yeah. has yeah. some, yeah. It looks yeah. like it has little strip. trails little down to it, the little strip. Well, it's and Stone Crossing, I mean, I don't know how much they would love people necessarily parking on their street, but it's a quiet, much quieter street. Um, but we're doing the exact same thing. Yeah, so I it's mean, just moving it from one bad location to another between two houses again. No, we're utilizing the path. You wouldn't have to create a parking. She parking said they lot. walk down the path instead of drive down. You the path. utilize the right, the but trail you'd be that parking exists. in front of people's homes and then walking between their houses. Which, to your earlier argument, you know, you said that um, you understand that people don't appreciate the idea of removing the tree and the, you know the the people the the, yeah, the it's abutters. An it's an uh, it's, it's, it's street. To me, it's people park on the street. I, I just I, so I don't. I, I, yeah. I'm happy disagreeing with you on that point. I just. That, that's an existing street, it's a quiet street, people can park on there. Um, it's probably some place where people go uh, trick-or-treating on purpose because it's off of Ash Street, right? The little things that we think of when we're trying to keep ourselves from getting uh, run down. But um, I, I just feel like if we can access this property to fully utilize it, I definitely want that to happen um, without disrupting home, homeowners or minimizing disruption and minimizing expense, and not for nothing, a whole strip of trees and the whole hill going into to create the parking lot. I mean, it's not, it's not just taking down that one tree so and bam, you're all sure. set. It's a whole swath. I know our jurisdiction is one tree, but it's a whole swath of trees. Are you talking about around that cul-de-sac, the little offshoots? Yeah. Yes. What is that? That's owned by the Homeowners Association there. It's not owned by the town. OK. I mean, and I'm saying it can't, it can't be approached. I'm yeah, saying that's open. Yeah, I appreciate that. So but Jennifer, there's a there wider area, strip I mean, there so of Stone Crossing. Yeah. I think there's it might be owned. A wider strip that crosses Stone Crossing and Carriage Hill. I think it might be owned by Eversource or. I don't it, know it is a wider. I went over there and hiked down that trail and oh, went yeah. up to over it. And the place during Stone Crossing is a lot wider. She was talking about the houses. It's a lot wider than the houses. The strip between the two houses in. On Ash Street. Right. Who owns that piece of property? I thought, did you say the homeowners? homeowners nope. Well, so this looks like, is this here looks like an easement potentially? Yeah, yeah. The homeowners. 
so. No, well, we don't know that, though. But you, Mr. Chair, I brought up a point that I hadn't really considered. Is there a bunch more trees that would have to come down <laughs> behind that in order to make access? Yeah. So a bunch of healthy oh, trees. Oh, I mean, we happen to be yes. talking about yeah. one unhealthy tree because it's on the top. Well, are they on? Because I'm seeing road. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the scenic road mm -hmm. jurisdiction that we have really. Right. Which is only that those two trees that are in the public. You're talking about that the wide strip that crosses Stone Crossing, like perpendicular. Mm -hmm. That's yes. owned by NSTAR. I'm so sorry. Got it. I know that we have a rather contentious a relationship with EverSource these days. Can we all go take a look at it? I think that might be reasonable. Um, uh, I mean, sidewalk? Yeah. Sidewalk. So I guess after the information from the tree warden, I don't have any objection to removing the two trees, right. but it's the stone wall that I think I'm stuck on because none of these alternatives seem great, um, But uh, so I don't know what to do. I'm actually <laughs> okay with the stone wall, but all those trees behind it, that yeah. could be a problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which isn't necessarily our jurisdiction, but it's at least feedback right, right. that we give to the powers that be. And I think if our, one of our obligations is to look at alternatives, and let's look at alternatives. I mean, if, I mean, we know that we've already seen some of the alternatives that have been evaluated, but um, here we are doing a back of the napkin analysis, looking at this, and maybe it makes more sense to take a look at it for real and go down and look at it. Have you, have you guys, Mr. Chairman, have you looked at that option on um, Stonehill, that, that strip that's owned by Stone Crossing? Stone Crossing, that strip that's owned by NSTAR? I did not look at it, no. We, we would, I'm under contract to provide park. We did a parking lot analysis for this. So we, right. we, we developed a parking lot analysis for 15, 10, and 5 cars. Reduce the four cars and minimize as close to the road as possible to prevent to reduce any impact to the bottom. And it, I believe the smallest. If I'm not mistaken, Pam Pam mentioned that that was part of the uh, the it's grant. A it's a requirement. So if we were to go through the the uh, Stone Hill area, that the, we're not putting parking spots in there. But if I can just. Correct me if I'm wrong, there's no quantity, so the two that are already there may in fact I see. So from a practical take standpoint, care of that. we want people, more people than are gonna find that tiny little access, we want people to open up this property for people to access, right? So whether it's a requirement of the grant or not, like if that two spots necessarily satisfied right. the grant, and then we could- those two spots are actually on public property. They are, they are or they they're are not. not. They're on an, eas an easement that the town has. They're so, so on private property. So we are under obligation with the grant to, to put parking spaces on the public property. I believe so. Okay. Only for so, $400,000. <laughs> so if we were able to access through that easement and tuck a parking lot right at the at the corner of the um, of the property, that would satisfy the grant, if that was a possibility. I don't, yeah, but I'm not quite sure you're going to get any less damage there than here. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. There's already a road. There's already a road. There's no tree or stone wall. There's no tree or stone wall. The road already exists there. Yeah. So, based on the informal discussion, it appears that a site walk would be beneficial. So, move for everyone. <laughs> um, Let's stretch our legs. Do we want to for a sidewalk? It's probably too dark right now. Yeah, it's too dark. <laughs> uh, do you want to say a favorite time and day of the week? Saturday at nine. <sighs> <laughs> Sad sigh from that other end of the. Could table. do it since we have. Right, we have two Saturdays in between, right? Yeah, so two Saturdays, three. And the twelfth. Yeah. And and the twenty ninth, three Saturdays. Well, it depends on the 29th of July and the 5th and the 12th. August. Of August. When it, when is it being? If we continue it. Oh, you're being. right. The Saturday is the 29th and Saturday. Okay. That's okay. There are three potential Saturdays. I'm jealously Saturdays. guarding my Saturdays. I've been counting these. I'm, I'm already in August. In yeah. <laughs> That's what we do in summer. So um, I am I, I am 
not this doesn't matter you can do it without me I'm not available on the 5th or the 12th that's the only reason I know so that's when I that brackets when I'm well running. can Similarly, we I'm say this and then we come back and discuss that people look on their own yes and visit before then yeah and we set up time at the meeting at the next public hearing to discuss what sure. we sure. found and might be less intrusive for the neighbors than having us all show up, of yeah, course. Can I just make a suggestion that you clarify what everybody's looking at? So, yeah. like, some people are going to Stone Crossing and some people aren't going to this Ash Street property. Well, why don't we go through? I think the obvious is to look at the proposed right. location. Uh, the, the second would be D, which is the existing location just to... Well, I really think we should look at G, F, E, and D, just so that we see what are all the, the four asteroids. Well, the problem with, I mean, we can, we can do, but G, the ones that are not tenable publicly, G you know, a, 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 a private parcel, if we come back without having the property owner already saying it's permissible, the fact that we might like it, mm -hmm. but we don't, it's not granted. It could be a new point. Could be a real point. I just but think I it's going to come up at the meeting, nevertheless. So might yeah. as well. I've seen it with our eyes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We'll give you uh, can't look at more. Yes. <laughs> okay. So we'll, really uh, we'll look at all the options that were proposed and look at the stone crossing option. <laughs> now, which stone cross? If you look at stone crossing on the map, right. there's one that comes up at like 12 o'clock. Is that the one we're talking about? It or empties off into A, basically. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, between A and B. Is that the one we're talking about? Where are we? I was, I was thinking this is the wider one. I was thinking no, the one. we're talking about this big. Yeah, uh, the NSTAR this, strip. This NSTAR strip. Okay. The one that intersects with the road? It? Yeah. When I'm you drive down the road, you're going to see it. It's a pretty good size. Okay. Oh, this? Yeah. Oh, I was looking at these little guys. Yeah. No, Amy pointed out this. Okay. It's very hilly. Like I'm not really sure. It's that's why I was good to work. That's yeah. just for the record. That's why I was having a problem with that because I thought you were looking at these two strips and those go right by people's homes. Yep, right. Yeah. And I was very concerned I about gotcha. that. I got gotcha. you. Okay. I was that, I was not looking does at that the right. directly connect to the property, the wide swath. Yeah. Well, it looks like it diagonally connects. That's a that's a really great question. It does no. not. It does it not does connect. Not. No. So it connects this to 97 Ash, which is privately owned. Right. Okay. And then if we go the opposite direction. It connects to town property on the other side, but then okay. you've got to make your way up around. Up to A. Yeah. Mm. Is that what you mean? It goes up to A. Well, it connects to another piece of town. It's that property. white spot yeah. Yeah. next to A. Yeah. yeah. I would say we'd want to definitely look at D and what I'm calling H, the proposed. Yeah, definitely, um, the, definitely okay. the proposed. <laughs> so when do we have availability at the, the next meeting? Um, 830. 14th 835. at... 835. Oh, no, that's the... I was at the wrong end. 830. 835. 835. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And why don't we say 835 to 930? to allow probably more than enough time. Yep, so August 14th at 8.35. We get a motion to adjourn, to, to continue. To to continue. I'll make that motion to continue this public hearing to that next meeting at 8.35. August 14th. Thank you, August 14th. I have discussion? I can't do it. Uh, yes, yeah. So no discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? So carried. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we let I can we reopen the meeting? I I neglected. We do have a, a person here. So can I get a motion to re uh, reopen motion to for re comment? Reopen for comment. Second. I'll make that motion. Sure. All okay. in favor? Aye. 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 Sorry. So thanks, John. Um, just a, a question and comment sort of rolled into one. I know there were several parking lot options uh, created 
uh, of varying sizes, um, numbers of spaces. And I, I believe my understanding is that if it's four spaces or less, it's a lot less town approvals. Um, it's a question, I guess. Can somebody comment on that? Uh, site plan review will be required for five spaces or more. So at four spaces, there's no site no, plan? That's correct. Okay. So thank you. I think just to ask one more quick question. Um, have they looked at the op option of going through legacy at all? I mean, I, legacy has a lot of people that like to walk. And when I went over to Legacy and asked them if they have trails, they said, we have lots of trails. That's one of the things that they um, advertise or market are trails. So I, I've hiked behind there, and I've, I've noticed that. Does that come wanted. up right behind A, B, and C? I think it's the top, it's very top, yeah. right, the little loop. Is it, I don't. The very loop right oh. here. But this would be open space, maybe? Or I don't, we don't know? I mean, I think that's, no, a, question. No, that's a question for that's the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To see if they, up here, what they've done. Yes. Open space or open that's just still here? Yeah. Open space for the town? Um, but who owns all this? No, right now it's just legacy's open space. I don't believe the they're going to, they, they don't give us that. Okay. It's just restricted oh, land. They need hmm. to maintain it to meet all their land quotas. Legacy. Crazy as a town. <laughs> can I just, yeah, like, can I just, so can I just say <laughs> you made a valiant uh, effort to keep us on yeah. track and get this so done? Let's club, we've continued. Let's continue this discussion on August 14th. 14th. 8:35. Well, we, let's get a second motion to close. The temporarily opened. I, I, I will close. A motion to close. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Sorry, Jennifer. I don't care. <laughs> Thank you guys for your feedback. Yeah. Do you, and I do think you we have covered. To to no, do you think? No, 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 no. I think we got the tree warden's input, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah was, Thank yeah. you. Paul, you don't got off to the next. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Paul. We appreciate your input. We appreciate it, and I think you represented well. As long as you can tell us what we can do with the gypsy moss. Excuse me? What can we do with the gypsy mob? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what's killing all the pine trees, too? No, it's an entirely different matter. What's, what's killing the pine trees? That is a another fungus that actually is more active during the winter months than it is during the summer months. So what you come out of the winter with is you lose all of your old needles, and you're waiting for your brand new terminal bud to break. So you've got this very sparse pine tree. So of course last year with the drought situation, you get that one needle group to open up and that was it and it wasn't enough to support the trees so you lost a lot of pines. Oh. And if it's a mild winter, you can expect to lose more because the fungus will be more active. The fungus wants moisture in 40 degrees. Do you think they'll Days come like back? Today. Do you think they'll come back, the trees? Yeah, if the trees that are in the woods and are gen generally healthy, more than likely, if they're in parking lots, traffic islands, they're almost completely going by the board. They just uh, the root, root, root area is too restrictive, and they're just not strong enough to take it. So I read this, and a little knowledge is dangerous, but it said that the, the pine trees they do not store any energy in their roots. So when they get eaten up by the gypsy moss, they're less likely to recover than a deciduous. They tree. don't refoliate. An old tree will be defoliated, will refoliate. So right. they still have photosynthesis going on. If a pine tree is completely wiped out, uh, it won't refoliate, and therefore that's it. It's no, no photosynthesis, and now now you get a dead tree. Thanks. Hmm. Thank you for the info. And on that well, hit, any other uh, items for the agenda? I'm only curious about if we've heard back about the training possibilities. Um, I've sent a couple emails and have not heard back from them. I, they are the group that I'm talking to are, is an extension of UMass Boston, and I have a feeling they're on a summer schedule summer at the moment. So. I'll uh, try to reach out again, but I have a feeling we'll be hearing from them when they get back in session. Did, did my Hawaii training get approved? Yes. Oh, good. <laughs> as long as you can take me. 
We get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. So carried. All right, we made it through another night. Okay.